What's up, everybody? Welcome. How's my audio? How's my video? Welcome to another little Eat Me Make Family stream. And guess what, guys? Today is a very special day. We're here with uh, with a close friend of the show here, Mr. Jay Dyer from Jay'sAnalysis.com. Jay's got a YouTube channel. He's been on the show several times. We'd had some fun conversations in the past. I believe uh, last time you guys saw Jay and I together, it was probably the Ask Yourself and uh, and Vegan Gains um, amazing debate where we got totally, where we got completely crushed by <laughs> by Vegan Gains and, and Ask Yourself. Um, so that was the last time you guys saw Jay on. What's up, Jay? How's it going, man? Good. I'm just recovering from having been chewed up in those massive incisors of Ask Yourself and, and Vegan Gains and having been digested through the colons of both of them and having all of my life sucked out of me and then being uh, uh, deposited out of the anuses of two two wreckers two microphone wreckers Microphone. check 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 uh, <laughs> dude they i'm trying to recover from that devastating yeah yeah i can imagine i can imagine jay i mean this is a it's a little bit orthogonal what we're talking about today <laughs> It's a bit orthogonal to what we were talking about in that conversation. <laughs> Dude, we really need somebody needs to make that remix, the fact remix. That would be fantastic. Dude, uh, did you see? Uh, ask yourself. Someone sent me a video. He actually made a video um, declaration to the vegan community about how they need to change the definition of veganism so it removes all uh, possible uses of should <laughs> and and <laughs> so, are you serious i swear dude he put this video out maybe we should do you want to should we watch that maybe uh i could get your dude, these people i'll tell you what the, they're their own best refutation i could never out argue their own apologetic against themselves which is just their own behavior <laughs> we don't even need to watch the video but he essentially let me let me i just want to get the title because i have it pulled up um um what was it called? Oh, I had it pulled up. I have it on a tab. He, he essentially, in the video, though, says that we need to change the definition of veganism, which the technical de definition of veganism is... Uh, let me look. Let me actually look it up so I don't misquote it. Um, yeah, don't misquote this because this is a religious right and you could be burned <laughs> as a heretic. Well, as a trans vegan, I don't want to be, uh, be responsible for, for blaspheming these... Uh, their, their the, vegan pontiff, the vegan pontiff will sick his... UK soy cops on you to have you burned at the at the stake. All right, Saint Gregorium of vasectomy will uh, <laughs> 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 will not be happy. So veganism is a way of living which seeks to exclude as far as possible all pra and practicable all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, or other purpose. So he said we need to remove all um, uses of words and avoid all uses of words such as possible or practicable <laughs> because it's impossible to define and we're never going to be able to get through an argument with this. Uh, but I'm not even sure. He didn't get to the, uh, you know, how do we define exploitation or cruelty? Um, you know, so using words like unnecessary cruelty, he said we need to avoid. Um, so, yeah, he's, 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 re he's reworking his system now to make himself more, uh, he says, more appealable in the mainstream. So he's looking for that. He's trying to get on that Piers Morgan debate train, you know. He wants to be on Dr. Phil. <laughs> That'd be so funny. Dr. Phil and ask yourself, in interviewing vegan yeah. gains on his daddy issues. <laughs> there was that, did you see that? There was a crazy I'll vegan. tell you what the saddest part was, the, the, the whole mob that they have to send to downvote everything. Oh, yeah. Because... If you have the best argument, if you can win the debate, why would you need mobs of people to come? Why would you have to organize on your Discord to have everybody come downvote the videos? Yeah. I mean, shouldn't it be clear that you have the best argument? Absolutely. Absolutely. And he um he didn't really like having to actually question the presuppositions of his worldview at all. And he had it all set up in his mind. I thought it was so fascinating how guarded he was and how he'd already set up this whole bulwark of of defense against ever getting to the point of um you know questioning that why do you think do you, why do you think uh people are so afraid of questioning the presuppositions of their worldview like that 
Well, because we hold paradigms like like people hold to a faith. I mean, essentially, that's what our paradigm is, is, is the grounding of our whole system by which we read the world. So naturally, all of us are going to be a little, you know, sketchy about wanting to question it. And especially if we feel like there might be an argument that that would force us to have to change, you know, the whole thing was, you know, about how if something's logically true, there is a logical force by which you should accept, you know, a better argument you should accept the truth, the truthfulness of something as opposed to the falsehood of something. And everybody knows this is true. Everybody knows it, a priori, it's obviously that's the case. Otherwise, there's no point. You can't debate. If, if that's not true, then and then both sides of the debate don't have to submit to a better argument. It, then what is it? Just rhetoric? Just who looks better? Who you know? That's retarded. Uh, and we know we look better than those guys. So we win that side of the debate too. So <clears throat> so I mean, he. That's why it's it's it forces us to have to admit we're wrong, and it's just human pride doesn't want to admit it's ever wrong. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a funny little shit show. Um, and before that, we had a nice show. We talked about the uh, what, what was it titled? Something, uh, the alchemy of the soy boy, um, mm-hmm. where we talked a little bit about culture creation, um, the roots of the modern culture creation zeitgeist, and where this stuff's coming from. So I titled the chat today: "Social Engineering of the Millennial." <laughs> the social engineering of the millennial. It's it's not a New York accent. It's, it's like, yeah. This is uh, this is going to be the new word, social engineering. Well, I have to give you credit, dude, because uh, since we've been doing some shows, uh, you kind of have refocused my attention on the whole vegan thing because I guess I just didn't really pay attention to that niche of YouTube and how big it was getting. Yeah. And you guys, were you were talking about how this is going to be the big push. This is what they're going to go for. And then we see The Economist is putting this out, The Guardian's yeah. putting it out. You know, within within a few days after your your streams, you, you're seeing this all over all over mainstream media. So uh, there's, I mean, it just kind of reinforces the fact that this is not just you know YouTube discussions and debates. This is really a top down plan, and they are pushing it with every bit of energy they have. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and you, it's funny because you'll see the same exact article published on several mainstream outlets within 24 hours and that's regularly happening now every single week this week was beyonce and jay-z promoting a vegan diet and beyonce's yeah beyonce serious i'm serious dude beyonce and jay-z but it's like yeah you know (laughs) it's over the top um and their celebrity trainer is putting out a new book and it was uh i think it was like forbes magazine there was like five different articles we talked about this yesterday on the stream same day w magazine forbes um, CNN all saying oh, Beyonce and Jay Z with almost the same headline. It's basically it's a press release, right? There's, it's not even real journalism at all. Yeah, I want to comment too on a lot of people who've who've messaged me uh, and made comments whenever we talked about this in, in various social media outlets, which is the idea that that oh, uh, a lot of church fathers talked about uh, fasting, and a lot of church fathers talked about doing this kind of a diet and a lot of monks and people like, okay, first of all, that's the ancient world when they didn't know as much about health as we know today. So that, that is true. There is some truth to the fact that we know a lot more about health than we do than people did back then. Secondly, there's nothing in my view that, that says that we, that we have to, uh, uh, at all times only eat meat. Now I know that people do take that view. Um, I'm not saying that that's wrong or right. I think that people have to, in a case-by-case basis, make decisions on their situation, their health needs. And in fact, even even orthodoxy does that as well. I mean, the, the, the bishops oftentimes give a lot of dispensations for health issues, right? So if a person has diabetes, something like that, they don't, they're not bound to the fasting. So also, it's important to keep in mind that there was not a massive plan uh, 1500 years ago, uh, 1800 years ago to push this from a top down scam system approach to ruining everybody's fertility. Now it was true that elites back at the time of Plato, they knew about, uh, how to control men with diets, but you have to also have to keep in mind that meat was, was a much more of a rarity. Meat, meat was something that was more expensive. It was something that, that wealthy people would eat, you know, back in the, at that time. Right. Right. Uh, and it's a lot more prevalent nowadays. 
So, so we have to at the, on the we have to balance tradition with the reality of the present day. You know, for example, I don't mean to ramble, but but dude, no, you know, no, this is great because it's right in line with what I would have had a personal conversation. Because this is what people, so people will say. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 oh, but but what about fasting? What about this and that? Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with fasting, but you also have to keep in mind that we have to deal with the realities of the situ- situation in our day. Th- there wasn't genetic modification. 1300 years ago to to I mean there might have been cross breeding but there wasn't this crazy Monsanto Bayer situation mm-hmm. you know in right. the year 300 right food wasn't right. weaponized right it's like the we the exactly. wheat the corn and the soy it's like the these options that we have I mean I think the issue you mentioned all meat diets right which is something really popular nowadays you know we talk about this a lot on my channel too I don't believe everybody should do an all meat diet I end up eating a mostly meat diet for various reasons I think there's a lot of plants I could handle. I just, you know, I don't feel as well when I don't eat meat. So personally, mm-hmm. it's something that I've gravitated towards. But it is always something that, uh, you know, you come up upon, you know, December, right? And uh, in Eastern Orthodoxy, you have a f- month of fasting right now. So as somebody who's really interested in Orthodoxy right now, you know, I've read a lot of books, actually many of them on uh, from your reading list, Jay. And I want to thank you and uh, even some of the people in the chat here who have kind of led me towards, you know, accepting the principles of Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, and, yeah, so really appreciate that. But the month of fasting, it's very interesting because it is, you know, it's abst- abstinence from meats and stuff like that. And this could be very difficult for some people who are dealing with health issues. And I think it's interesting that you bring up, you know, the differences in the world, the differences in what's going on geopolitically uh, with food. Um, and, you know, the meaning of certain foods in the cultural context that we have now having changed. I think that that is well, important. Well, I can tell you right away that across the board in the Orthodox Church, people that have health issues, there would not be they would not be required to keep the, the fast in the same way. So typically there might be might, the idea might be we'll fast from something else. Right. Yeah. Uh, but generally it's on a case by case basis. But you're never going to be required to do something that's against your own health. So. Yeah. So anyway, these are situations that we can't be legalistic about. There's there's prohibitions like about going to the theater in the ancient canons, okay? The theater in the time of the Roman Empire included worship of the gods. Right, sacrifice. Yeah, so we don't apl- that doesn't apply to going to see a play or going to see, you know, a movie unless the movie is, you know, exceptionally degenerate or something. Yeah. So, so it's the principle of the thing. We're not slaves to to traditions and laws. They have to apply to the modern day. Yeah. Um, and it's like Jesus says about the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, right? So the the purpose of the law is man's good, not being a slave to a bunch of legalistic commands. So, so yeah. So it's not really about that. And none of the none of the people, by the way, who have objected to us talking about this stuff, have any awareness of social engineering of how this is being promoted from the top down, of what Richard Branson's involved in, what Bill Gates involved in. They don't know any of that stuff, but they want to moralize on this kind of stuff. And I think it's Well, I mean, if, you, if you're getting out. pushed back from the non-secular world, I think, it, you know, there's even scripture one could point to, um, you know, speak, I think it was in Timothy, uh, where it talks about, you know, the, the forbiddance of certain foods that are made by God right. for man. And, you know, the, in the latter times, the, the, these doctrines will be, um, spreading. So I think, I think this most yes. definitely ties into that. And it's, you know, it's kind of undeniable to anybody, um, who is familiar with scripture that, uh, you know, forcing veganism is completely not scriptural, <laughs> you know, in any, exactly. And, and that's, you know, seventh day Adventists, the entire thing is based on that. You know, they're, that's actually who's behind a lot of the push for veganism in the plant-based diet is seventh day Adventist yep. studies are used to justify this. Um, yeah, I used to argue with the Seventh Day Adventists a long time ago mm. about this issue um, before veganism was like a popular thing, but um, but they were always talking about it, and uh, you know I point out that Paul says that that's demonic. <laughs> he says yeah. that trying to forbid uh, people to eat certain things that God has given uh, is demonic in the same way that the, the forbidding of marriage. So what you'll see here is that that the forbidding of the foods and the forbidding of marriage is also a big part of the the globalist plan because it's all about destroying your health destroying your ability to reproduce your progeny that's what it's all about absolutely yeah uh, th- thanks a lot for touching on that that's actually something that uh you know i would i titled it the social engineering of the millennial you know kind of a funny title but it's always nice to uh, to ground uh the conversations in you know jay and i both coming from um you know, a, a more eastern orthodox christian perspective 
Um, that's kind of where we're coming from, where I'm coming from when I speak out against things like uh, the promoting of drinking blood and human blood and cannibalism, right? Because we've got a lot of people, you know, in, maybe in the chat right now, and they come into my chat almost every time and start talking about how, oh, why, is, you know, why, why, should, why do you say drinking blood is bad? And, you know, I mean, even if you're not going to adhere, you know, even if you don't adhere to the same presuppositions as we do uh, concerning reality as, uh, that, you know, as Jay and I might, like, is this really something you people want to spread in your culture? Uh, vampirism and you want, you want kids running around the neighborhoods draining cats of their live blood and <laughs> adrenalizing fucking animals and drinking their blood? So I don't is know. this because of the, like, the carnivore type of diet no it's no 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 there's there were some people there's a guy in 2012 who came out with a book vonder planets um and i think he kind of opened the floodgates with that he, he recommended drinking blood and there are a few people who are against veganism very anti like there's a lot of former vegans get into it right so you know you, you you're a vegan and you've got this thing and then you leave it and then so that, that go to the religion, opposite extreme absolutely absolutely so that's i think what we're seeing here is a lot of that and you know i mean there's a lot of people like in Western society, dude, as a millennial, we grew up with, I mean, what was our moral compass? Like we grew up with heavy metal and rap music and television telling us what's good and what's cool. And shit, even Disney's totally satanic. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think there's no real belief in morality among my generation, among right. millennials uh, for the most part. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it, I think that's probably where it comes from. People don't have a basis in morality. They don't believe in morality. And it just comes... Well, right. everything is moral because we can. Is it is it associated with? I mean, because I've seen it pro promoted like in certain like Dawkins says, oh maybe we can figure out a way to eat people or crap like that. And I've seen like certain occultists. And it's I remember like the first lords. time you had, it's more like edge lords on the internet. Yeah, it's like yeah, dude. But is it no is morals. it associated with like neo pagans too, or are any of them into that? For sure, for sure. It's well it. It's uh, it's associated with the same presuppositions about nature, you know. Uh, well, it's not natural. It's natural to do this or that. It's natural, you know. It's without really defining what's the difference between natural and man-made. This is what we see a lot of on the internet now in the neo-pagan movement. So maybe this is an interesting I thing see. to talk about concerning the millennials is the the whole neo-pagan thing. Have you seen a lot of this lately mm -hmm. too? That I have seen because it's uh, essentially being promoted online. Um, I think that the establishment is perfectly okay with neo-paganism as an as an alternative form uh for western european type people to go uh, because i think those movements are controlled and and you'll see a lot of the people who who go into that into that realm of things um the rest of their worldview doesn't match up with anything coherent i don't think yeah. so you know, and I've gone on a lot of these shows. I've gone on a lot of shows with the people who've gone in the direction of, of paganism, neo-paganism now. Um, and I hope that, you know, I hope that we could have debates about that topic, but I don't think a lot of these people really want to have debates. They just think Christianity is, you know, cuckyanity or whatever. But I don't think they're going to find anything better in, in the pagan and neo-pagan cults. And if it was the CIA and the Western establishment that has been promoting that stuff too. I mean, look yeah. at... Um, let's let's take one er uh, example. Before all the alt right came about, the uh, Nicholas Shrek, not Shrek the you know cartoon guy, but mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. Uh, he was married to I think he was Zena Levay's husband or something. He's one of the Church of Satan guys, basically. Mm -hmm. So you can find clips of him on I don't know like Donahue or some shit in the eighties. And he's everything he says in his interview is what the alt right says today. Mm. And what he talks about promoting is the rebirth of paganism, the rebirth of uh, of uh, uh, European paganism, Nord paganism coming back, Odinism. This is back in the eighties, okay? So so there's a satanic element to that side of things. It's just as much antichrist, just as much uh, Nietzschean antichrist, Crowleyan antichrist, as is the other op opposite of the social justice nature worship. They all meet, basically. I mean, the social justice nature worship soy boy uh, vegan over here, uh, in, a, in a weird way, it comes all the way back around with the far right, alt right, satanic, European, neo pagan, Odinist guy. They meet at the, at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Precisely because it falls back into just worshiping nature, mm. cutting down the population. They agree on population control. They agree on worshiping nature. They agree on thinking that they're the elite when they're not. It, 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 both of those those schemes fall back on one another. 
Yeah, and but the definition of nature is always so vague too, because then they'll they'll delineate between what is natural and what is man-made, right? So they'll talk about, oh, these are just man-made beliefs, and it's like all these religions are man-made religions, but apparently accept their belief and their religion. Well, you know, what, 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 what do they both embrace? Culture of death. They'll both they'll both yeah. embrace the idea that death is natural, death is good, since right. it's quote part of nature, like you're talking about. There's nothing wrong with man taking hold of death and engineering it. This is what uh, Russell says, this is what H.G. Wells yeah. says, it's what uh, uh, Jacques Attali says, it's what, what's the other, uh, um, Ghost in the Machine, Arthur Kessler, he says, mm. this. He, says man, he says the high priest of the scientific community have a duty to step up and engineer death uh, and control it in order to kind of give a speed, like a, like a bump to evolution. <laughs> So it's this. That's I mean, this is what gets you Alfred Kinsey molesting a bunch of kids. Peter Singer that you talked about a few mm. shows back. This that's that's what that's what that worldview gives you. So you're absolutely right. And I want to stress too that that when you see people like Nicholas Schreck, who was back in the '80s promoting alt right, then uh, um, those groups are also funded by the the CIA and NGOs just as much as these bigger left type groups. There's, there's no difference because they all, again, the basic foundations end up being the same. Yeah, and it's funny. And you see it kind of permeating out through society and through these Internet cultures. And you see things cycle in and out a lot. You know, it's on it, veganism getting a big push right now. But then it seems like a lot of the people that want to push against it, you know, they see what's wrong with veganism. What do you fall back on? What platform can you put your weight on to push against any of these worldviews or any of these um, degenerate things? I, I I think people are remiss because they reject, you know, they reject the truth and they want to just kind of stand yeah. on something that's nonsensical and they end up spouting basically new age crap, right? So you mentioned like neo-paganism being kind of supported by the establishment. I think a lot of these people say, no, that's bullshit. The establishment right. doesn't push that. But I think you're you're totally right in line. Like um, uh, changing images of man, that's what it's all about. You know, I mean, it's, uh, what's his name? Joseph Campbell. Um, you know, the establishment yeah. has been promoting Blavatsky and the, what's the right. Alice, Alice Bailey. So yeah, I mean, they, those are that's neo pagan revival stuff, and the same shit that a lot of these people are promoting is exactly that. Yeah, primitivism, uh, return to primitivism, archaeofuturism. Um, you could look at some of the people who are part of the traditionalist camp, uh, like Miguel Serrano or uh, Savitri Devi. They're kind of inspirations to the alt right. Uh, they were what were called esoteric Hitlerists, and they actually believed that Hitler was like another avatar of of the Buddha or the Christ or Muhammad or whatever. He's just another one of these avatars. And so all I'm saying is that that not, neither alt right in its uh, what what's sometimes been called uh, in its antichrist uh, manifestations, nor the left and its social justice warrior, they're both demonic and they're both evil. And they both, again, fall back on a culture of death. They both rely on a phony elitism, like, oh, I'm, I'm elite because I uh, watched a bunch of videos on YouTube about <laughs> paganism. Now suddenly today I accept Odin and that makes me special. Yeah. And just because, you know, some group's trying to get you banned because you're into Odinism and you talk about white rights or whatever, that doesn't mean that you're against the system. It just means that your niche is fighting another niche within the system. Um, in his phony uh, dialectics. Good, yeah, a good example would be uh, Prince Bernhard, who was in the SS. He's one of the guys that founded Bilderberg. And he founded that with a bunch of the other elitists. Uh, and now, is, does that mean that Bilderberg is anti-establishment, right? Because Prince Charles, who uh, went into help uh, founding the World Wild Wildlife Foundation, which is all about promoting mass death, depopulation, Right. So are they the good guys because they liked Hitler and they like depopulation just because they're the they're the real proto alt right. <laughs> right. So and I'm not just here to bash on alt right. I'm just making the point that it doesn't matter whether it's it's the the Nietzschean. Let's set up a pagan empire or whether it's the the David Rockefeller globalist guy over here on the left. They all converge on the same points again of as we saw in the globalist book series I did. What do they all what do they all believe? They all believe in some form of global empire that is based around elitism, phony elitism. They all believe in a culture of death where death is promoted, dysgenics is promoted, uh, Monsanto type crap, uh, uh, sterilization, mass death, 
uh, what does Prince Philip say? I wish I could come back as a as a virus to kill off most of humanity. No, right? dude, Snopes says that's not real. It's okay. And Even though in the video he says it. Yeah, <laughs> like but Snopes. More bro. than once come on, in dude, the video. Snopes. I Googled it, man. The top results on Google. Now, this is one of the things about millennials, right? It's like we've been... Even though, you know, I was, I'm a millennial and I went to university or whatever, so I, I, I even knew, and we even talked about this in the university, how you can't trust just the top results and you have to understand that mm-hmm. Wikipedia is not a good resource. Um, but my, it seems like the millennial generation is so easily controlled by the top results on Google, it's ridiculous. That's a good point, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm like one year from being millennial. I'm like, I'm almost on the, ver- the line there. You're an honorary Gen millennial, Z. yeah. I'm an honorary man. So, and I was late to college. So, uh, I remember working as a research assistant at, in grad school. Like that was one of the first things you learned. Is that, like you can't just believe the fact that, you know, like the top of some search result, but I would have people that would come to the library and they would be like, they would be millennials and they would be like, uh, how does Google work? And I'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> like you don't know how to use a search engine. I'm not joking. Like people, like every day in the library, I'd have people like I'd have to show them how Google works. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not dissing all millennials. There's a lot of smart millennials, but there's also a lot of really dumb ones too. Yeah, yeah. What what year were you in university and college? I did a long track of college because I was working full time the whole time I was doing college. Oh, uh, so you're not a I millennial was, then. Because <laughs> I was working. You, you, you're working, man. You're not a millennial. Your your honorary millennial status has been revoked. I was doing the grad work from like 2010 to 12, 13. Oh, somewhere. man, yeah. I was just getting out in 2009, and it was starting to get a little crazy. Like the Occupy movement started on my, uh, mm-hmm. on my campus. I remember that. Because um, I was in Santa Cruz, and it started in Berkeley and Santa Cruz kind of simultaneously. And it was basically it was students occupying the, uh, the staff building saying, we want free education, man. We want free, <laughs> we want free stuff. If you look to, uh, we talked before about Tim Leary. Hmm. Um, T- Tim Leary, Terrence McKenna, uh, those are examples of some of the left hippie type guys that at times their stuff will break through over to the neo pagan type stuff. Yeah. So there's, you're right. There's a very, a lot of people don't realize this is a real close little, like it's just a, a hair's breadth away from new age the fathers of the new age over to the neo-pagan type stuff. I mean, just take somebody like Crowley who influenced Terrence McKenna and Tim Leary openly. Mm-hmm. You know, Crowley is, is the father of Wicca as well as a lot of this fake elite, uh, modern Satanism and cult occultism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What about Kenneth anger? You know, he's somebody who's been, oh, he's another great example. Yeah. He's an interesting guy, right? Kenneth anger. Did you put him in, uh, in your book at all? You got any? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think he comes up in both of them. At some point, I know he does in the first one. I think he comes in this in the second one too. But, but yeah, I mean, he's another again devotee of Crowley, and he was kind of pushing the avant garde before anybody else was, and so he was putting out these really weird kind of experimental films, um, working with you know people that were associated with the Manson cult and all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. working with Roman Polanski and like the Process uh, Church, Ro- Process Church, hanging out with Rolling Stones type people. Um, and you've got him making films like Loose for Rising. So he was ahead of his time in terms of this, the satanic push in Hollywood. Um, and we're seeing that now with like um, the new version of Sabrina. Like I remember back when it was that, that Nickelodeon chick, you know, who was like Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And oh, it was yeah. It was all inno- light and happy. It was fairly innocuous. And now like the new one is like just straight up like here is how you, you know, do rich witchcraft. Here's how you do the, the, all this kind of ritual stuff. It was mm. pretty hardcore. Uh, like I, I just looked at the first episode of the new, of the new Sabrina. So yeah, I saw within, one you know, still shot from the first episode and it was a uh, Baphomet temple. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like really dark. I mean, it's like just way more hardcore than it was, you know, back when it was what's her face. Yeah. Back in the nineties. Yeah. We were so, I was talking about some of these shows, you know, we had Sabrina, the teenage witch. We had, uh, Captain Planet too. I mean, yeah, was Captain kind of, Planet's a total propaganda. Dude, that was like the worst one. And it was like these five kids, and they're all each is a different race. <laughs> they all get rings, and they put them together, and then and then like gray skinned NPC skinned Captain no green skinned Captain <laughs> Planet, or maybe it was green ha- green skinned with like blue hair, and he flies, and he comes and he saves the world from the evil polluters. And just, exactly, it was just ridiculous. Yeah, and Fern Gully came out around the same time. I remember when I was mm-hmm. a kid, Captain Planet would come on, 
I remember Fern Gully came out and Fern Gully is about evil oil companies basically destroying Mother Earth and this this valley of like a bunch of, you know, gay critters in the in the valley or whatever. Yeah. And evil oil companies are the the, mo- the villain is actually oil, which is retarded because oil actually comes out of the earth. <laughs> like it's not it's not so some evil. toxic thing. It's not it's, it's not the evil. Blood of the earth, Jay. It's the blood of the earth. It's the right? blood of Gaia. You're burning the blood of Gaia. Gaia's black goo blood. Um <laughs> And then, and then, you think about modern movies like um, Avatar. Avatar is the same type of propaganda because Avatar is literally Fern Gully remade. It's the exact same plot as Fern Gully. Uh, and then, if I recall, uh, James Cameron is a radical, big-time vegan proponent. I think that's right. Yes, you're absolutely right. James Cameron okay. directed a film. And if you uh, if you get into any debates with vegans online, they'll start telling you, "Well, you just wait till Game Changers comes out." Uh, he directed this like huge million dollar film, um, and I think it's still waiting uh-huh. to be released. Uh, and it's just talking to vegan athletes. And what's crazy is a lot of these people who he talked to have already switched away from veganism because <laughs> they got so fucked up by it. So these like top performing athletes, a lot of them, they're not vegan anymore. But the film's not even out yet. Um, yeah, James Cameron, he also made, uh, you, you mentioned Avatar. Um, I always, I always thought that was like Pocahontas, right? It was kind of the Pocahontas story too. Uh, it's Fern Gully and it's Pocahontas and it's the Smurfs. Pocahontas, Fern Gully, Smurfs, 3D, Smurf. It's like Smurf sexy <laughs> vampires, right? Cause they're kind of vampires. They have vampire teeth and like the, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Now, we did a, we did a Hollywood decoded on it. I had to, uh, uh, be nice about it. So I had to like try to find the positives in it, but pretend that it was like a good film. Yeah, but I, I don't. I'm not a big fan of Avatar. I thought that was horrible. And you know what? I I hate those 3D movies, man. You put those glasses on, and your your head starts hurting after about Gives five you a headache, minutes. Yeah. Give me a huge headache. I think that's part of the programming. You got you got to really mess up your rewire your brain while actually watching Roger. the film. Well, that was really tied in with transhumanism too, right? I mean, that whole film it is was, all about right? interfacing with a false reality. And I'm thinking while I'm watching that film, I remember thinking. How do any of these people know that this place they're in is real? They're probably just out there killing. <laughs> they could just be in the Amazon, like killing humans, and they think that they're on some foreign planet. Well, another yeah, exactly. Another element to this was the Sam Worthington character. If you remember, they choose him because he's in a wheelchair. So this is like the Wounded Warrior Project. And if you look at what DARPA actually does the way that they sell their transhumanist stage one stuff, beta version of it, super soldier, you know, cyborg type stuff is that mm-hmm. they say, Oh, look how much we're helping wounded warriors and the, the, the sad veterans who've lost an arm. Mm. That's how it's being pushed. And then you look at the actual people behind transhumanism and they completely hate humanity. They don't, they don't give a shit about these soldiers. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, they're just guinea, they're just guinea pigs basically. Yeah, and, and I mean the whole the whole dialogue is about upgrading humanity, right? Like we, mm-hmm. we nature fell short in their worldview. Yeah, and you know, my, nature my is wrong. Book, and, I have a discussion of Avatar and Fern Gully and and Alien, and this is a good good tie-in because there's a lot of similarities between in Alien the idea of of man and the universe being an abortion, which is this kind of Gnostic doctrine. And if you think about it, that's essentially what the point of like the aliens busting out of the gut, you know, in the in the old alien series by Ridley Scott is. And Ridley Scott even said, I think as he said at times, like, well, there's an aspect to this which is about abortion and and is humanity an abortion and all this stuff. And oh, well. and it, it and it starts to make sense when you realize that he utilized the artwork of H. R. Giger, yep. who was a big big do- devotee of Crowley. So I put all that in the new book, and the reason it ties into to uh, Avatar was just this idea of again that man is the problem, man is the disease, man is what's causing all these problems, and together we have to unite and prepare for the coming uh, body mod uh, cyborg revolution that's coming. Once once the once we start getting the microchips implanted, and then once we start getting you know eye patches that like fashionable eye patches that can see through walls and tell us everything about i mean they tried that with google glasses but whatever they bring i don't whatever they bring out uh is going to be sold as a right 
a human right. And that's what Timothy Leary said. He said, I had more success selling people on blowing their minds on, on LSD by telling them that their rights were being suppressed than anything else. So all they have to do is couch it in the next phase of uh, civil liberties and everybody, all the dum-dums, all the, the NPC zombies are going to jump on board mm. because that's that's the easiest way to manipulate people. And that's what the plot of Blade Runner 2049 is about is is the the guy in Rosling character. Mm. He thinks that he thinks that, you know, he's he's an NPC. And then, oh, what does he find out? He's a part of the bot revolution. And so he gives his life for the for the revolutionary cause of the the replicants versus the. The old broken humans. Yeah, well, I'm really interested in also uh, the character that Jared Leto plays in that film. He was a really fascinating example, right? Because he, as you go up higher in the human hierarchy, in the Blade Runner 2049 universe, the humans are more inhuman than the bots, yeah, than, the, bots, the, than right. the robots. And there was even a moment in the film where I had came up with a, a theory, well, maybe the bots and the actual robots are really human. <laughs> maybe they're actually human being born, like, biologically, and they're, they're just ritualistically programming everybody to dehumanize them. <laughs> and that they're – because uh, – what's his face? Um, uh, I mean, this probably there's probably reasons in the film that this wouldn't work. This theory might not work. But – I think it's an interesting thing to think about now when uh what's his face uh Leto who doesn't Jared Leto own the the Laurel Canyon house where the military yeah. base was That's Exactly yeah he bought he bought the I I don't I'm not sure if he still does but at least he did for a long time I think he still owns the yeah the Lookout Mountain Studio is his house and mm -hmm. he converted it over into a house I've got I'm trying to pull up a screenshot of Leto's character but he's so fascinating one scene he actually sacrifices one of his replicants, she drops out of the sky, out of the you know the top of the building, out of some like tube thing, and tube of he, goo, yeah. <laughs> and he cuts her womb, and he does it in a very ritualistic way. And the way that he's talking, it's it's is a really strange scene that almost mm -hmm. makes sense if you think uh, <laughs> from the perspective that I was just uh, proposing um, that maybe maybe the the replicants were just real humans and they're so dehumanized and the world was so fallen and so twisted and so um, in this transhumanist um, madness that uh, that people would believe it. Um, That's an interesting analysis. I, I think that it's hard to know exactly where they were taken the second one. Uh, I didn't think it was terrible, but I didn't think it was it was amazing. I thought it was it was it was a decent uh, attempt at a sequel, but but in that scene that you're talking about, I just watched that. I got to that part right before we did the show. And what he says there is that he says that I am going to create a new uh, uh, branch of angels. Like I'm going to create a new series of angels. And he's like, we're going to storm heaven and retake Eden. And that's actually a direct quote from, from Crowley. Quote, yes. Crowley said that, that in the future that, that he would like to see the storming of heaven, the retaking of Eden. And, and you can find parallels between Crowleyanism and uh, transhumanism as well. I think at root it is Crowleyan. But who, uh, who, who wrote the book Storming Heaven? Wasn't that wasn't that uh, Leary? Wasn't that Leary's book Storming Heaven? Or was that a different? Uh, he may. There's a guy called Jay Stevens who did an analysis of the history of um, LSD and culture. Okay, that's it. Uh, who's not really? He's just like a mainline academic. It's a pretty good book though. But but he said that he called it Storming Heaven. Yeah, that, you're, you're right. But it probably he probably did name it after Leary, and Leary would have got it from Crowley, because um, he was a hu huge devotee. But but yeah, that is uh, essentially what the Jared Leto character is saying. He's like he's like we're going to, I'm going to create a new slave race. That's what he says. He says we need a slave race of people who do what I fucking say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we'll then we'll storm heaven and we'll get rid of all of these broke ass humans that mm -hmm. are the the old the old models that can't be fixed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's he's upgrade now. I started watching it again yesterday too. I didn't uh, I didn't get through the whole film either. Uh, but I'm just, you know I'm scrolling through it right now, uh, looking for some interesting screenshots. I think the beginning of the movie is really interesting as far as like the uh, the whole smart city, uh, you know the yep. mo the millennials paradise, the smart city. Um, <laughs> you know I mean uh, yeah. So you watched you watched it recently too, right? So you're pretty fresh on uh, on exactly what you know. It opens up showing just these massive like solar array panel things in the middle of right. um of California and it's this overhead shot 
Uh, yeah. And then it shows them harvesting bugs. Uh, a man harvesting protein. He's on a protein farm. And people are exactly. now eating bugs because they can't have cows, um, yeah. which is really funny. Because I mean, yeah, this is this is ask yourself and vegan gains is my this is their version of the future. Like we look at <laughs> this utopia. is what they see. Yeah, because we haven't we haven't uh, listened to them uh, and the Rockefeller Foundation. What we have is giant mass pollution everywhere. We can't see the sun anymore, right? This is that's why they're having to grow this stuff in this weird way. Is because the sun's been blocked out from all of the pollution because of the overcrowded L.A. megacity, uh, yeah. which which ironic because it's the elite who want the mega cities. It's the elite who want to spray the skies according to Cass Sunstein to blot out the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Wall Street Journal just put an art article out last week saying scientists are just now going to experiment with blocking out the sun because of global warming. Uh, but the movie says, oh, no, no, no. It's because of overpopulation and pollution that the sun's been, I mean, we're supposed to think that the sun's been blotted out. Uh, and so, yes, we're having to basically have giant bug farms uh, to feed everybody and give them their give them their protein because everything is synthetic. It's hard to tell the difference between what's real and fake in mm. this future. Mm -hmm. So if you were to if you were to eat something synthetic like meat, I guess it doesn't give you nutrition. I, I don't know. Or eating meat's forbidden probably in in this in this. It, I would guess it's all rationed, right? Because the, the only yeah. time we see him eating, I think, is when he he goes home, right? He goes home after this little journey, and he meets mm -hmm. his girlfriend. Um, and who's his who's his girlfriend in this movie? Yeah, his his synthetic virtual uh, CGI girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. His 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 chick is a. Uh, oops, sorry. We're hearing some audio from Blade Runner right now. I don't want to get his sim girlfriend. Yeah, his sim girlfriend. She's she is an AI um, program that is in his home, and she's basically Alexa, who projects from a monitor. Good point. Yeah, and, right. they, and he gets a gift, right? Like, so he can bring her portable. He, he gets, gets downloadable content to make his girlfriend be able to leave his shithole uh, coffin apartment. Mm -hmm. Which is literally the, you know, that's where most of these vegans who are out there propaganda <laughs> you guys into. That's where these people already live. They live in coffin apartments in L.A. and Toronto. Um, so here's, I'm trying to find a shot of his apartment. He comes into his apartment, he jumps in the shower, and it gives him like 10 seconds of shower water. <laughs> and that's all he's he rashing. gets. His ration, yeah. But when you look at Jared Leto's character, he's like in this, you know, I don't palace. know. Palace. He, he's in a palace, right? I don't know. I'm not sure if it was a pyramid. Back in the uh, in the other film, it was in a pyramid. It was a giant pyramid, yeah. His room that he's in is filled with water. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> it's the infinite water around him. It's water reflecting all the way. And I think that's kind of interesting because when you look at like, well, you have, you see the 5G rollout now, right? So one of the things that actually will weaken electromagnetic frequencies and radiation is going to be uh, water. Uh, so, you know, trees will interfere with it, rain, water does interfere with the uh, with EMF. So I think that's, it's an interesting detail that they put in there of, you know, I mean, there's probably different uh, factions in this hypothetical future that Blade Runner exists in, which isn't that far off from where we're at right now. Uh, but there's probably other right. factions and uh, corporations that are battling it out for power. And, um, you know, so surrounding your the, the head of the corporation's lair with water would perhaps protect him from, uh, you know, attack from uh, from other weapon systems around. I think that's kind of a funny. That is an interesting point. And that comes up in uh, signs, too. If you remember, the only thing that defeats the the demonic entities is water. Um, just side note there, because we just talked about that on another podcast the other night. But... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a lot, a lot. There are some interesting symbolic elements to this. I think that the um, that tree at the beginning, where he finds the body of the, the remains of Rachel, this is where we're led into the idea of it being a miraculous birth because she's a replicant too. At the end of the first Blade Runner, and so it's impossible that she can give birth. Oh, but it's a miraculous birth. She's mm -hmm. she's somehow able to. That's so why my the, theory. It's like, well, maybe they're just human, and it's you know, it's all bullshit. They're just lying. Well, in the first one, if if, if we want to take seriously the first one, which is obviously a far superior film, uh, Ridley Scott did say that that Deckard is a, a replicant because there is the scene where his eyes light up red. Mm -hmm. So I think we're I think we're and I think. Philip K. Dick is kind of, since it's based on his his work. Uh, by the way, did you know Philip K. Part of the reason Philip K. Dick was able to put so much of this into his fiction is because he was actually hanging out with the Silicon Valley people back 
in the 60s and 70s. So he actually knew where they were going to take all this stuff back then. So he wasn't like magically, you know, talking to aliens. He was just like, hanging out with these <laughs> Silicon Valley type people, mm -hmm. Pentagon types. Yeah. Uh, so he knew what was he knew what was coming. So that's when you're watching Blade Runner, you're getting Philip K. Dick, you're getting the sort of predictive programming from, you know, guys hanging out at the at the Pentagon. Um, and I think 2049 is just another update version of that. But but yeah, it's a replacement version of a new mythos, the new Christ mythos, the Moses mythos, miraculous birth mythos in the Bible in Genesis when uh, I mean, her name is Rachel, and at one point, Wallace, the Leto character, even refers to the biblical story of Rachel and Leah. Mm -hmm. And Rachel's the one that's barren, and God miraculously opens her womb in the story of, of Jacob and, and Rachel and Leah. Um, thus, we're supposed to, again, think that the reference to Rachel, the Mary Sean Young character giving birth, uh, is is a miraculous event. And this is gonna. This is the bot revolution that's gonna stop. You know the. the <laughs> what, what I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't really even make sense. Like why there would be a revolution because, Jared Leto just represents like I was talking about earlier. He represents like the the right the alt right version of the revolution, the Crowleyan version of it, the Nietzschean version of it. Yeah, he and to then, me he represents like the millennial. He's the quintessential millennial, right? Because in twenty forty nine he'll be you know he'll be an adult. He'll have come to fruition, and he's totally modified. Even his eyes. Or you know whatever mm -hmm. is in his eyes, you don't. They do a good job. I think they did a great job with his character of making it vague. Mm -hmm. And I like the you not knowing what. I mean, he's got this thing in his neck, and it's just like a little yeah. light. <laughs> so you don't even know what level of humanity is left in this thing that's supposedly yeah. a man. Um, right. Yeah, he's he's like the ultimate millennial. You know, he would have he would have been growing up in my generation and been, um, you know, a, a grown man at that time. And he's he, his yeah, whole thing I mean, is go ahead. He's basically the Monsanto Bayer human new hum, Newman new human factory. That's mm. what he's up to. He's just a, it's just a cloning bot replicant factory. He kind of represents a version of God the Father, like a, like a Gnostic evil version of God the Father in a way, because mm. he's a new. He wants to cre be the 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 father of the new humanity that's going to replace the human race. Mm. But what I'm saying is that that his opposition, or who we supposed to, we're supposed to think is his opposition, is. Ryan Gosling and the revolutionaries who want to who meet underground and like they you know they're they're gonna start yeah. the revolution and so it's like Antifa versus <laughs> Crowley yeah. and like Crowley and Antifa are on the same team. It's pretty funny, right? It's, I feel like they put that revolution thing in there just because of kind of the, you know it, it in line with the spirit of the age kind of thing. Everyone yeah. wants the fake revolution and you know you got the uh, and he's patriarchal too. Don't forget, like he's. He, he has a woman in subjection to him. He has the hot secretary. Yeah. You know, he cuts open the wombs and then tosses them away. He doesn't need them. But the revolutionaries, they're led by women. They've got a bunch of women everywhere. In, in yeah, it's all feminists. And they have, like, their eyes popped out. So they got, you know, the one eye Versus symbolism. the evil patriarch, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, but don't forget, too, there was child trafficking. That was also a reference. There's yeah. also a reference to that because and child was, and yeah and child programming, right? Because what's that guy yes. doing with all these little rat kids? It's kids, exactly. He's got yeah. this whole underground thing of all these little thieves, and you know, it's kind of like in uh, Game of Thrones. You have the the, yep. the Meister has like his army of little kids that do his bidding. This guy's got that going on under there, and mm -hmm. also Ryan Gosling's character has these supposedly. I guess we learned that they're implanted somehow or something. Is that memory? They yeah. were implanted, but he has memories of being down there in that underground situation being programmed like these kids so it's very weird i feel like there's certain things they put in there it's like all right we'll never tie up this loose end and if we keep this loose it it gives this great mystique to the whole thing and some of them were corny but some of it worked i think the transhumanism angle was that, that they handled it pretty well and it was relatively realistic especially you know jared leto's character being so given over so just openly satanic um and you know spilling blood at times uh, sacrificing his own little creations. Yeah, and it is. He says, we, we make angels at the service of civilization. I'm going to create a new nine, which is basically a new uh, hierarchy of, of angels that are going to take over. Mm -hmm. He says, there's not going to be any per imperfections or falls anymore. He says, we'll own the stars. We'll storm heaven, retake Eden. Uh, so he, he definitely has that role. And, and he's, he's evil patriarchal raper man. Right, that's mm -hmm. what his character is supposed to be. He wants slavery, and then Ryan Gosling believes in equality, and they're they're going to be led by the miraculous, not man. It's not a new Jesus or male that's born miraculously. It's a new woman mm. who's born miraculously. He's gonna he's gonna lead the uh, Gaia revolution. 
Yeah, it's funny. And then she, you know, I haven't even got to the end of the film again, so I forget exactly how they flesh it out. But she just is kind of a prisoner in this digital cage her whole life, right? The supposed yeah, she, messiah. she has the ability to, she's very creative, so she kind of represents the power of the imagination and, and creativity. And that's supposedly been lost, I guess. So they're they're harvesting her creativity because she's superior to everybody for the, because of her feminine creative principle, uh, and she can tap you know directly into the ether or whatever and create this stuff. She's like um, dialed into Gaia. So, yeah. So, but and they're they're parasitically sapping on her for her ideas and whatnot. And she's the miraculous birth. We, we learned that oh, she was the one that Rachel gave birth to. Yeah, I think the the first half of the film is better before they start trying to flesh out the silly story, the the universe that they that they revealed in it was uh, was very telling. Um, well, that obsession with the synthetic is very prophetic. Um, the multicultural hellhole uh, is very prophetic. That was in the first one too. Uh, you know, I, I agree with you. I like the the, the character that Leto is. Uh, it's just that the myth, the mythos, the mythology of it in the end, I think, ended up being uh, kind of a, a typical kind of social justice type mythology. Yeah, yeah, it was it was kind of weak, but I mean, definitely in line with uh, the original's theme, like the Gnostic thing. I mean, you had mm -hmm. uh, Roy Batty choking his dad to death or his creator to death yeah. in that film yeah. uh, in the first one, which was very uh, Gnostic and kind of satanic and Luciferian. Yeah, that's the Satan rebelling against his father. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how these the the rebellion theme is it's so strong with the generational divide, right? Like I feel like the millennial generation we're constantly being uh, thinking every it's so trendy to be rebelling, right? Since I guess the boomers maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, engineered revolution is an old trick. Um, I think there's a great quote from Spengler Oswald Spengler, and he says that. There has never been a revolution that wasn't at the service of some larger monetary interest. And he says, and this fact has never been realized by the revolutionaries themselves. <laughs> They've always believed that their, so, that the, their social revolution was at the cause of uh, the greater interest of man, humanity. And they're never bright enough to, to actually look into who's who's funding my socialist revolution, who's funding my, you know, uh, atomistic individual revolution, all these revolutions uh, that's why it's always targeted at the youth because the youth aren't, they haven't lived long enough to realize, you know, how people can be manipulated, how groups can be used, how, yeah. how people are tools. And so they're very idealistic. And that's why, you know, Mao, look at Mao. He focused on his youth revolution because he knew that youth were too ignorant and stupid to realize that they were being used. Yeah, it's kind of, I've, I've been, lately been using kind of the, the calling vegans kind of the front line of the Maoist global revolution. That's a great way to put it. That's, they're a great example of this, yes. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's because they're youth and they're, every single ideology that gets pushed right now gets tied up in the vegan ideology. You have the eat meat bad, uh, that's mm. just like the one level of it, but why is eat meat bad? Well, because... Uh, climate change, global warming, right? Like the climate's changing and the meat is uh, adding to the climate change. And also people eat meat, of course, and people are bad. We all know babies are bad. Um, so yeah, I kind of see them as the, uh, as the front line of that. I mean, they, they just readily take on all these ideologies and will use um, that. They will use any justification and accept any authority that makes them feel like they're a part of this bigger, broad, powerful movement. That's going to change mm -hmm. the world. Yeah, I remember the first time I sort of realized in that the university system was being used for this was, well, my own experiences, but I remember I had a, a girlfriend from high school um, who was a sharp girl, and she went to a pretty prestigious university and started studying. She did law, and then she went back and did genetics. Mm -hmm. So very, very smart girl. And... Um, this is some years ago. We met up after she had gotten her, her grad work just to eat dinner and, and talk and catch up. And I hadn't seen her since high school. And so this is like five, six years after high school back in, in the early 2000s. And uh, in the midst of conversation, she starts correcting me about what terms I'm using to speak of other people groups. And I'm like, like five years ago, like we joked around and had fun in high school freely freely speaking but but she had 
she being very intelligent, she had been completely indoctrinated back in the early 2000s into correcting people in conversations about what terms they are and aren't allowed to use. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I don't submit to your authority. You're not going to tell me what term I can use in a conversation with you. But what I started realizing was that they're going to, they're really wanting to police speech. And I was kind of naive. I knew a little bit about conspiracy stuff back then, but I started realizing like, like, man, so she's having professors like telling her what you can and can't say. And you, you need to go out and correct people, you know, and take this phony moral high ground. And it, so it gives them a, 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 a um, a situation where they feel like they can be morally superior to everybody. It really just feeds their pride. Um, and here we are, that was 2003, you know, here we are 15, 16 years later and it's, it's gone light years beyond that. It's gone into just total crazy land mixed up. Like you, you on the one hand, there's no collective, uh, identities like, like, masculine or feminine or gender uh, uh but at the same time uh that's all that matters is, is whether you know <laughs> i have the gender and the idea that, that, that i want right i mean it's just it's just total madness gender doesn't exist but you misgendered me and that's a hate crime mm-hmm. yeah it's insane <laughs> yeah, I, I, where do you think this i look i'm trying just looking at kind of the cultural kind of the spirit of the age right like it seems to me like a lot of this got instilled into my generation in in the public school system, um, you know, where mm-hmm. you're, you're trained to kind of, I mean, there's this, there was this constant nannying about like what people are saying, what, you know, bullying yeah. was like this big thing where it's like, yes. there weren't bullies really at my school. Like there, you would see some shit and then someone would get corrected, like within the social structure usually. But then there started becoming this really big push about like, you know, about bullying and people's feelings and sensitivity. They started sensitivity training everybody in the schools. Yes. And I remember, I just, like, the structure is always funny, too, right? So when you get in trouble, you get a write-up or you get a mm-hmm. referral. Uh, you might get on, you know, what's it, time out when you stay after school? Uh, you might come to detention or you, you don't get to go to recess or you go to the principal. But it's like, the, and then it's this training you to be within this weird, vague, bureaucratic system where you don't even know what's okay and what's not okay. And now we have social media, and it's funny because you see the way people act. They're treating social media like it's the schoolyard, right? Like people want to run to Twitter and YouTube and tell on people because they mm-hmm. hurt their feelings or they said something that, uh, that disagrees with them. And I think... Um, you know, a big part of this is just, you know, training everybody into this nanny state world. It is. And it's also another way, more deviously speaking, that the uh, people who are hip to the game, they're just using it as a means to try to take down other people. Hmm. Uh, like if somebody's successful in comedy or something like that, uh, somebody's more successful than you, what happens is a lot of the lesser uh, well-known social justice types they'll band together and they'll report you know somebody who's more successful oh you said the bad word in your comedy routine <laughs> and they think that they have gotten ahead by taking somebody down like oh we got his netflix special cancel we got his you know his show <laughs> taken off the air because well, we got him now now we can rise so that, but they're so stupid to realize that that's only going to damage them in the long run because they're going to be policed in the exact same way and the policing is going to go infinitely crazier than it already is Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I even had one of these social justice vegan, vegan people uh, threaten to sue me. Uh, vaguely, that, yeah. Totally. It was so vague and never got a letter from the guy's lawyer at all. Um, lawyers. I'm sorry, lawyers. He had multiple lawyers. It was just... <laughs> Still, it's like if YouTube does, and then if and we're gonna get your YouTube channel taken down. I got down. the same law team that OJ got, dog. You better watch out. Yeah, yeah, man. He has Johnny Cochran coming after me. Johnny Cochran. <laughs> or wasn't He's wasn't not even alive. Karda- Robert Kardashian, right? Wasn't that guy involved in the, the OJ trial? I was, uh, man. I, I remember that Judge trial. Ito, I was, dude, you're going down for sure. Judge Ito, man. He was he laid down the law. <laughs> How, dude, how funny is it? You can have you have like O.J. Simpson's trial in front of the whole world, but like nobody even knows what happened to the Boston Bombers. <laughs> what happened to that trial, man? It's like, or uh, I don't know. I'm not trying to get deplatformed. Here, we but. speculated that on a podcast a long time ago. We speculated that the the whole O.J. thing might have been prepping people for reality TV because yeah. it was right before MTV started doing. Real world, which is what introduced everybody to 
to reality TV and and we found I think some evidence that reality TV was birthed partly in in concert with the idea of getting everybody used to everything being filmed and surveilled. Yeah. So I think I think there's something to that. Well, the show was called Big Brother. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Remember? Yeah, good point. And that was a, yeah. the failed one, but then you had you know the I guess you had Real World and Road Road Rules. Or road whatever. Rules, right? And those were on since like the '90s, but they got really big with and the Jersey Shore. Remember Jersey Shore? Mm-hmm. That was like maybe Jersey Shore. That was almost like the the transition between reality TV and social media reality TV that you see oh, on YouTube yeah. now, right? It's a good point. Because they, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one of the guys from Jersey Shore, he's like a ketogenic diet advocate. He calls himself the Keto Guido. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, one of those guys. Maybe I should have him on the show one time. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, hey, uh, I'll try to get uh, hold of him. Uh, look, can we? I want to keep going, but I gotta, I gotta do do the wee wee again. Yeah, man. Yeah, no, go for it. Take a little break. I've got some videos I can pull out. I'm not. I've been yeah, having trouble. Video. I got a wee wee real quick. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll share. Uh, I'll pull down the. Uh... All right. Let's see what's going on here in the chat. What's happening in the chat? We got people. Uh... <laughs> What's up, guys? Beatbox says peace reflections. Oh man, you got you guys know what's going on with Nature Boy. Nature Boy's thing is falling apart. So that's that's another funny thing, right? We we're just talking about reality shows, um, and now we're seeing like the most degenerate, insane reality shows ever manifesting on social media via guys like Nature Boy. So um, yeah, that's fascinating. Thanks for. For reminding me of that reflection. What's up, everyone? I remember when I was in second grade in public school, some families got mad at the Pledge of Allegiance because it says one nation under God. LOL says nature's world order. Yeah. We can we'll change it to one one people under nature. Under nature. Then all things will be permitted. <clears throat> Alright, what's up everyone? Alright. I've got some videos pulled up, but I've been having trouble sharing them through with audio going through Skype. Um, where'd those videos go? Alright, let's talk about this. Alright, so my buddy, Frederick Leroy. I don't know this guy. I don't know if that's his real name. But this is his Twitter. And he's actually Frederick Leroy on Twitter. Oh, not that one. Where'd it go? Browser. There we go. So Frederick Leroy on Twitter has been putting out some really, really interesting threads. This thread here, talking about the meat tax narrative. Now he's on to some of the same research that I've been looking at, guys. Uh, and I've been kind of communicating with him in and out via Twitter. So follow Frederick Leroy on Twitter. And this is a great Twitter thread on the meat tax narrative. Uh, talking about the financial interest behind it. Uh, you know, you've got Oxford University publishing this study from that guy Marco Springman. Um, that's his first part. Oh, there he goes. He talks about Marco Springman, of course. Now, Marco Springman is connected to, was it Beyond Meat or was it the lab-grown meat? I forget, you know, all these connections, it gets, it gets so incestuous when you start looking at these relationships. Uh, but you're seeing through this EAT, EAT, and the Lancet, this network of uh, plant-based promoters demonizing low-carb diets, demonizing meat, demonizing fat, and promoting, <coughs> oh, Jay's back, and promoting um, plant-based diets really heavily so check out his twitter thread guys he links a lot of these things really well and he's starting to see the links to the big ngos and stuff as well uh the connections to the rockefeller foundation that you always see running through these uh these pushes for plant-based diets and for lab-grown meat and for more monsanto type stuff you see guys like bill clinton who he got out of the draft due to some help from winthrop rockefeller how dare you how dare you (laughs) So yeah, he's always holding them. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you, Tristan? How dare you? Dude, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, what's going on, man? 
I don't. I, it's, you can't I have do a hard it. time saying it. That's all I, can I say love. I love Bill Clinton. He's such a. He's such a funny voice. He's just such a like. I dare got, you. I did not. I did not inhale, and I did not have sex with that woman. I did not do anything. How dare you? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Bill Clinton. So, anyways, guys, check out that Frederick Leroy uh, thread over there on Twitter. That's a really interesting one. Jay's got his coffee now. Re up on the coffee, or is that water? Uh, it's coffee. Is there any? Uh, uh, we got any haters in the chat? I'm trying. I'm trying to find some. Our chat's being really tame. I think I've, I've cleaned up house too much. Cleaned out to me the hate. Yeah. They all. Out. If you don't clean them out, they'll try to say crazy shit and get you in trouble. Yeah, you know. What can you get in trouble with? You can get in trouble for shit people say in your own chat that you don't even approve. Say that again. Can you get in trouble for what things people for things that people say in your chat? Because I've been kind of lenient lately. I heard, I heard that, but I don't. I don't know how true that is. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, I do. I I try not to let any blatant craziness go through there. But uh, yeah. You know, people are talking about. I the think real they've world. got an algorithm now to where it's pretty like you know. It, pretty much flags anybody that says anything mm. sketchy. Well, I was just talking about, remember uh, remember Nature Boy we talked about before? Yeah. I don't know if you've been keeping up on the Nature Boy TJ, but Nature Boy's been going I'll let for you. I let you keep up with <laughs> Nature Boy for me. It's just it's such I, an I example. Get, I get the Nature Boy intelligence report from you. <laughs> yeah, right. So to me, <laughs> Nature tough. Boy is like... He is the example of just like the program so busted ass, like millennial, right? Just um, total self-contradictory schizophrenic ideology, clutching onto these weird new age ideas, creating his own uh, reality show. Um, he has now gone so deep into this craziness. Like you've got people putting up screenshots of Nature Boy telling them in private message that he cured HIV and herpes in a woman that was in his cult, which is about polyamory. Um, and she got, pre he said she got pregnant and she had a baby. And then nature boy had this video of him, like at the birth, filming the placenta, talking about eating the placenta. Um, it's just so much crazy shit going on with this, but it made me think about, you know, we were talking about Jersey shore and all these shows before, but now it's like, these shows don't really exist anymore. Now we just have YouTube, right? We've got this same thing is happening at a mass scale with these little stars on YouTube. And it made me think of, you recommended this book, and I thought this book was crazy, The Brief History of the Future by Jacques Attali. Um, and I know that you've uh, you've written about this book and you've done some uh, really good work uh, and analysis. And if you guys want to find, first of all, Jay's new book, um, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, you can find this on his, uh, on his website. There you go. Esoteric Hollywood too. There's a link in the pinned... Uh, comment on this video. If you guys click down below, you can get the book. Get it from Jay. Don't get it from Amazon. Um, but yeah, how do you think the ideas of Jacques Attali, how do some of the ideas of Jacques Attali in his book, A Brief History of the Future, tie into this whole social media millennial um, techno, uh, technophilic mm -hmm. society that we see spreading now? Well, it's funny because he's the uh, mentor of Mitterrand and Macron. So all this rioting in France that we've been seeing anger at Macron, it's actually anger at his handler, Mr. Attali, who is essentially the Kissinger of France. So that's who this guy is. He's the Henry Kissinger of France, uh, right up there with uh, Rock with Rothschilds, basically ruling France and putting in into governance the stooges like Macron. Mm -hmm. So that's who this guy is. Total technocrat. And if I recall, I think he does have a section. He does talk about diet. Like he talks about where diet's going to be in the near future. Um, do you, I mean, you've, it's probably fresh. I read it a year ago. It's probably fresh on your mind. But I know, I know, I do remember him talking about how uh, we're going to move to the smart cities. We're going to have essentially a global brain of everything being connected. Internet and AI is going to run everything. Yep. Everything education is going to be, you know, basically tailored to you over some tars bot walking around alexa essentially he talks about that essentially yeah. in your house um he talks about the global Hi government hyper coming. surveillance right He's, he talks yes. about the the nomadic society too. nomadic like, society yep i um, thought that was a really interesting specifically part. in entertainment yes he said that there will be live streaming events uh, he wrote that in 2006 so he was 13 years ahead of his time talking about live streaming and then he said that what it'll eventually be will be global live streaming and that way, everybody will, will kind of have like their their Hunger Games style, 
you know, where you're like root for your uh, person who's, you know, in the giant global gladiatorial game who's going to, you know, die or who's got to, I don't know what they're going to do, but but it'll be a Hunger Games type scenario is what he talks about. Do you remember if he talks about diet? I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, he does. talks about rationing of food and, and you yeah. know, like the... Okay. Uh, the increasing globalization of all trade, and he talks about he mentions GMO and says, you know, there might be some issues, but it's probably not going to stop, and we might need it. I forget exactly what his point is. He he was wishy washy on a lot of those details, um, yeah. but he definitely nailed the whole millennials becoming uh, transient, right? Yep. Like just transient culture of millennials and traveling and rootless and cons- rootless consumerism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what we see. I mean, even even the counterculture figures that you see and these little weak counterculture movements online they're all rootless millennials traveling around just you know living the the youtube uh i live in my i live in my little tiny van a tiny house a tiny van for my tiny micro penis i'm a millennial Dude, you've got. I'm I mean, really though. But, I mean, have, is, have you seen this? The tiny movement, right? Yes, dude. One of the top vegan advocates on YouTube. Um, this this like so soyified guy named uh, Mike Mike the Vegan, and he's got like these little. He puts like, <laughs> I'm Mike the Vegan, and he's got like a red beard, and his hair is all curly, and he like Jerry curls it. It's like all like these little. He, <laughs> I swear, he puts a bunch of oil in his hair before he makes videos. Like, I'm Mike the Vegan, and I'm going to debunk everything that people say is against veganism today. Um, he makes these videos from his tiny house, dude. He lives in a freaking tiny house in uh, Illinois, I think somewhere in Illinois. Uh, and, he, and he talks all about how we've got to, you know, decrease our carbon footprint. And the best way to do it is a vegan diet. And here I am in my little, you know, four square foot house, and it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, there was a – I remember when I was uh, doing – I was at an Airbnb when we went to LA uh, a couple months ago to speak out there, and the Airbnb was up in the hills of Topanga Canyon, and it was it, like if you look at the pictures on the Airbnb to to get it, it was like angled to where it was all big, and and then you get there and it's like actually it was really small, and everything is obviously expensive up there because that's all it, Topanga Canyon is where the the millionaire hippies live. Yep. They're they're all driving like you know uh, Mercedes SUVs and going to these big festivals to be hippies for the earth. <laughs> They've all got like thirty, forty, fifty million dollar houses and shit. Yep. Anyway, so we're at this Airbnb and it's all squished in and tiny. And I'm like I'm like what is with this? Well, I noticed she had a whole bunch of literature out. Hmm. And she was a nice woman. I'm not trying to diss her. She but she didn't know any better. She's and not watching this. Don't all worry. The, <laughs> all the literature in her Airbnb was promoting tiny living and how do you need to get away from having a house and owning a car uh you know you need you, you, all this just total propaganda and i'm thinking well this is perfect for for california this is perfect for because <laughs> that's the that's the test bed and you know, like they lead that's the tip of the spear like you said for for the whole for the whole uh, uh sjw type community but yeah this, this whole tiny living movement that ties into it and and what's funny is that atali talks about austerity and he says that when the bankers push austerity uh, and and the, he's the, one of the reasons for that is they're going to try to make everybody feel faux guilt for their overconsumption. So the, the globalists have pushed consumption and consumerism, and then they're going to start pushing guilt for you going along with what they said to do. Fake guilt. You remember when he talks about, he talks about, he gives, he coins this term transhumans, but it's not mm-hmm. in the traditional transhumanism movement sense. Um, I forget exactly how he defines it, but he's got this, the vanguard of hyper, hyper democracy, transhumans and relational enterprises. And he talks about how the new economy, none of it's going to be about products because all products are going to be manufactured by massive corporations and sent around the globe. And the driving force of that, he says, is going to be the nomadic devices. So your, your freaking iPhones, all of our iPhones, um, and this tech that's, you know, all consolidated, he says is the driving force behind the consolidation of a global culture. Um, I that, that was a pretty amazing insight that I haven't really, I mean, I've heard a lot of over the years, people saying, Oh, you know, the smartphone is going to surveil us. It's going to prepare us for AI running us. It's going to, you know, control us. And, but I, I had not really, until I read out talking about it, thought about the fact that how much it contributes to the idea of you putting your identity and your connections and your daily emotional 
connection, what you would normally get with humans, it's all transferred into this device. And so the device becomes essentially the thing that you read the entire world through. It's like Sandra Bullock and Bird Box instead of like she's got a blindfold. This is your blindfold is this thing. Everything gets interpreted through this thing. And what that does is it makes you a rootless, deracinated individual. Mm -hmm. That's why Atali is so stre stressful on the point of individualism is that you not having a family, yeah. you're not having a community, you're not being connected to people. You're just a rootless individual who sees everything and, and connects everything through this. Yep. And he talks about the crushing sense of isolation that's going to bring. So he, it's funny yes. because he knows, I really think he actually knows exactly what's going on. And he's a he little tongue-in-cheek at, at parts, but he talks about, yeah, it's more freedom, more freedom, more freedom. He keeps saying this, that the whole uh, linear progression of Western civilization... Of history is freedom. It's a joke, right? You read his, first, his whole first half of the book is, about, is all about increasing freedom. And every single step of the way, we get a little more freedom for the individual. And in the end, he, end up, he ends up admitting... Oh, yeah, and this all removes all freedom from you, ultimately, and you have no freedom <laughs> and no connection to anybody, and you're totally isolated and alone in this reality. And that's – he admits that. So I, it's it's yeah. really funny and very schizophrenic and psychotic the way he talks about it. I'm trying to find some of these interesting passages. All of these globalist guys, the big globalist people in their books, they do the, they do this exact same thing. They, they have a schizophrenic approach. Uh, they had then at the by the end of the book they admit that oh it's to just to enslave you and to completely control you, but it's okay because in the long run this is all for the greater good, mm -hmm. which is never defined except that we know that it's for the elite. Well, he has these interesting theories about the waves of the future, right? So he talks about turning the millennials into nomadic, uh, rootless people. Uh, but then he, he starts to talk about the anger of the secular. So the anger of peoples will erupt against the mercantile order and against, above all, the United States, which will direct it for another 20 years at least, the secular anger based on rational premises. And this is page 219 in, uh, in the chapter of uh, the second wave of the future. So he starts talking about this rebellion, kind of like the Borg, or not the Borg, the, uh, the, the in, in Blade Runner, the, uh, the underground, uh, the replicant mm -hmm. rebellion or whatever. He talks about this, and you know mm -hmm. this is in 2008. So um, at the same time, he's talking about setting up these massive AI systems, uh, but then he starts to talk about the anger. He says the anger of believers, right? So you're going to have people in the non-secular world, uh, especially those pesky Christians, he says, are not going to like this. Yeah, he says that there's a great possibility of a Christian resurgence. He even says it's possible that America could be a dangerous uh, player in this because America could convert to a theocracy, <laughs> which is that I was not expecting him to say that. That was very bizarre. He says a lot but, of uh, these, he says, yeah, a lot of countries will probably turn to theocracies eventually. Yeah. And then he's, but then he, and then he acts like he never says that. <laughs> and he acts, then he's just like, yeah, but it's still inevitable to this whole global, uh, you know, global. Yeah. Cause they're, they're going to lose because you can't stop the, the force of so-called progress. Of course, progress is never defined. No. It's always assumed. That's another thing that you'll see in all the, the Darwinians, all the, except for certain Darwinians who are a little more honest and will admit that, well, actually progress is just a made up human category. It's just the way that we read and interpret certain events. There's not actually progress out there. It's just a, a helpful, uh, term. But most of them actually buy into this assumption that whatever's happening is a linear progress upward. There's not really any reason to believe that, though. On what basis is these advances that Jacques Attali sees over the history of West, Russian civilization, why is that progress? Well, all because of a greater freedom. Define freedom. Why is that? Yeah, why is that progress to have? Maybe, maybe it's not. Maybe that's digress. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the whole the whole narrative of modernity. It's just this whole thing of like, oh, we're progressing, we're evolving. Um, the the whole Darwinian outlook on society and on humanity. It's so it it's so stupid. It's just so yeah. Linear. Well, I mean, to 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 be able to say that. Well, look, we have iPhones now. We have refrigerators now. Progress. On what basis is having those tech things? better you see progress assumes value judgment right a basis by which to judge that thing was less progressive this is this is better basically mm -hmm. but uh, what is the standard for this well there's not one so it's just this vague consensus of well we just have the idea in western civilization so-called that we're, we're progressing we're progressing it's better it's better to have maximal so-called freedom we don't even know what that freedom is though freedom i mean is yeah, the freedom. freedom 
Is is it just to to be able to buy a plastic PP if I'm a girl and put it on and say, therefore I'm man? Is that what that's all? That's what. So or is it to, is it to put your kids in public schools? Right. For how many years now? You know, I mean, it, what is it? It's 18 years, and then they go to the university. In the university, they just get broken up even more, especially if they go to the dorm rooms, right? How silly yeah, is that? Paying for what, hundred fifty thousand dollars of debt for mm-hmm. for this university education, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that's what maxim maximize. So what he actually what they actually mean is weaponized, maximalized freedom when it comes to your psychosexual issues. Mm. Mm, right, so and that's it, to damage you. But in yeah, the so like the, the release of all the areas of life. You're going to be in debt slavery. You're going to be, you know, in uh, policing of your speech. You're going to be, you're going to be completely controlled in the rest of areas of life. Yeah, but, but you can in masturbate your, in public. It's all, it's cool because you can your, go jerk off. In your cummies, <laughs> you can have all your cummies. <laughs> you can, you can go to, uh, you can, you can watch VR porn on your, uh, on your Google Glass while you're walking down the street and jerk off in the, in the near future in the smart cities, and you'll be masturbating in front of everyone while you walk down the street. You could put your pee pee inside the tree. You could put your pee pee inside the carcass. Put your, you put, put your pee pee in the poo poo. <laughs> you want freedom? Maximum freedom. Basically. Yeah, freedom. The freedom to put your pee pee in the poo poo. <laughs> it's, it's just like the most childish. Philo- yeah, it is. <laughs> it's and it's so dumbed down the way they teach it too. You know, it's like they teach us so young. It's like, look at this freedom. Look at the look at look. We've got we've got Johnny here. Johnny Johnny's wearing a uh, a wig, and Johnny's a woman today, and he's wearing makeup, and he's gonna dance for you children in the public schools in California to tell you all about the freedoms that we experience. You know, it's just like it's it's so over the top and it's so dehumanizing. Uh, yeah, and uh, at the same time, it's like. You know, you you're not free to criticize this. You're not free to, to free to criticize the cultural uh, revolution that's been happening, that's being forced on us. So how is it freedom? You can't even question. Yeah, it. for a lot of people who live in a lot of areas, they're not free to have normal food. They have to get you know garbage food. Like in the South, there's a lot of places where people no longer they don't do farming anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's all like big agra corporate farming. That a lot of people don't have gardens, so they have to go to these giant corporate outlets to get food, and you have the freedom to choose between, you know, garbage from Kraft or garbage from Hershey's or garbage from whatever. That's your freedom, but you you, you don't have basic access to like healthy food. I mean, that's you, you that's all know, over this. You don't even know how to make food. So we, we were talking about right. this yesterday with a uh, with a Gen Z. Uh, girl who came on, uh, her name was Megan. Really cool conversation yesterday um, about her experience in the university. And it, I was kind of thinking about this this week with my wife. You know, it's like you have the family has always traditionally been where you learn how to curate your environment, maintain your environment, a healthy worldview, a healthy home, a healthy, and you know, you're, how to feed yourself, right? But the millennial generation, like, and especially these generations after that, I guess since the boomers and, uh, really started, but it's been the opposite of that. The family has been completely destroyed, and we don't even learn how to feed ourselves. We go to the public schools, and we eat Arby's and Pizza Hut, and mm-hmm. li- like I had Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, and Arby's every day uh, in high school, or no, junior high, that's what they fed us. Like that was The school lunches in California are literally Pizza Hut and Taco <laughs> Bell, dude. I'm serious. <laughs> And they may have changed it, but but when I was in seventh eighth grade, we had Arby's, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and I would get uh you know just these little sweet roll things, Hostess mm-hmm. microwaved or something. And then did you had- did you have a milk carton? We had bags of milk. Oh, it was like a cartons. bag. It was it was the most like dystopian <laughs> thing you could imagine—a plastic bag of milk. No, it's and natural. It's get- more like an udder. You get to cut it. <laughs> 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 you have to you have to puncture it like a like a high C box with your with your with your uh, with your with your straw, but uh, I don't know. I'll never forget the bags of milk. And I, I even at the time I remember thinking, man, this is like a dystopian movie or something. Like like you go in this line and you get this tray and this bag of milk and it's like, hmm. am I in prison? It looks like a prison. Like it looks like it's very you know yeah. analogous to like when you see prison guys eating their their meals. Well, I used to. I, I used to, me and my friends in, in high school, we used to joke about it because my high school that I went to in ninth grade, the floor plan, the architectural plan was literally that of a prison. It was. Wow. And we would always joke about it because it was a new school and it was just built. And it was Martin Luther King Jr. 
High School. Not a junior high school, but Martin Luther King Jr. High School in Riverside, <laughs> California. I went to for one year. It, the floor plan was a prison, prison floor plan. And, and when I was in uh, seventh grade, we had Columbine, right? So that, then, of course, th- horrific going to school every day after that, you know, completely traumatized that we're going to be shot up in our schools. Uh, and then we had, you know, September 11th. So I thought, well, damn, now the Muslims are going to come and shoot me up too in school. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> what the hell? Like, it just felt so, so frightful in this place. Um, and we had giant cage walls all around, all around this school. Um, and we used to joke about it. We thought it was like edgy and cool and stuff, but like we, we were right. It was no, they actually crazy. were designed on the basis of, yeah, like military and prison installations. Literally. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah. So that was you re- start realizing these things as a kid, and you see how that whole system is running. And it's it. I think kids have to. I think human beings are really intelligent. Actually, we actually do through. They are. Yeah. We see things, and young children see a lot more than most adults because most adults are just so cluttered up with their, you know, with our bullshit. But um, yeah, I think uh, I think it has. We have to be programmed really intensely and broken not to be able to see this stuff. Somebody in the chat knows MLK High School in Riverside. That's funny. Yeah, I went there one year, and then I moved down to San Diego County where we had open campus. And that was great because I could leave school any time because um, it was you know, open campus, so you can go drive off. It was, that was – Well, if, if, we, if we ever skipped nasty lunch, like you said, like we would, we would go to Pizza Hut or Subway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But equally nasty. Like we're skipping the nasty food at school to go to something equally nasty. I was lucky in San Diego, right, because I had uh, – Mexican food restaurants. There was like a little mom and pop Mexican restaurant where the lady knows your name. She's like, hello, Tristan. How's it going today? Are you supposed to be in class? <laughs> so, yeah. Hashtag bald man bad. <laughs> bald man bad. Dude, that's, that's going to be the, no bueno. That's going to be education pretty soon, right? I mean, do you, all right. So how, how soon do you think the education system is going to be more disrupted by what Jacques Attali called the nomadic devices, because we're already seeing a big rebellion against traditional education among, uh, you know, millennials and now Gen Z. But um, I, I can see this backfiring in a major way, becoming so much more t- uh, dependent on technology. Um, have you have you kind of inter- uh, looked at any more threads of this um, this angle? I just remember what he says that his projection is that by 2050. Uh, everybody, or it's either 2050 or 2080, he says everybody will basically interact completely through their personalized Alexa. Remember, did you see that movie, Her? Yeah, yeah. Like that. So the operating system will be personalized to you, and it'll probably be some some sexy Scarlett Johansson voice talking to you, you know, uh, like, like in Blade Runner. Like, it'll yeah. be a personalized... You know, assistant thing, and it's it will be basically your window to the external world. It's also going to be how you how you get educated. So your ed, your education, your inf- information, your entertainment, it'll all come through that filter to you. Um, and how? But I can't. I can't. I mean, it just sounds like a complete nightmare. I I can't even think of of all the dystopian movies together. I can't think of anyone that really could accurately portray how that would be but uh, yeah it's hard it's too hard to say exactly how that'll go down i mean hmm. i mean i know for sure that i, I read uh, i think i put it i put it in the new book i put the her analysis in there because of the fact that uh a few years ago when her came out apple was saying working with darpa saying uh, in the near future, we envision the operating system essentially, basically, Siri will be replaced with a thing that's going to talk to you, not just in this generic Alexa voice, but like it's going to more and more and more adapt itself to you, and you're going to feel like it's your best friend. And so we're literally going to see people falling in love with their operating system. I think I think yeah. her is where it's going to go. I, I had there was there was an article. I'm trying to find it. I had it pulled up. I want to share. Uh, it was all about the the technologies in 2019 that are gonna. Uh, it said, take over your reality or something like that. It was like a Forbes article, uh, and it was talking about AI that you talk to and you start interacting with AI. So it seems like 2019 might be the year that that starts to get pushed. Uh, that starts to get pushed out. I can't find it. I can't find the article. Sorry, guys. Um.
Let's see here. Let me check out the chat. What's up, man? Someone says Jay's big silver mic is juicy. They like it. They like the mic. <laughs> what about my mic, guys? We have the same mic. You guys just you like the Jay's. Same one. We have the same mic, and they think that yours is attractive. Look at that. What does that show you? Technology is making people lazy. I don't want to live in cyberpunk. Yeah, so Tristan, this... Tristan has a big black mic. <laughs> oh, Jay, stop it. I've got a big silver mic. <laughs> The AI overlords already exist. And so, many, right, so you know, this is why we're always talking about uh, on this channel and on this stream, like the destruction the last of. The section of my new book is that. The last section of the new book is Hollywood transhumanism. Nice. I can't so wait for I stuck, book. I stuck a good 50 pages of Hollywood transhumanism in there. And I think the craziest thing about all this, like, because you probably have some people in your chat that doubt, like, dude, in. In, t in 1927, Fritz Lang made a movie about AI sex bots. Yep. What was that and movie he's called? Got Metropolis. Mm -hmm. And and Lady Gaga was heavily like, her videos were very influenced by the Metropolis uh, uh, yeah. aesthetic. You know, so you see the Metropolis so, is very popular now still among Hollywood elite. Exactly right. But but I mean it just it does kind of blow blow your mind that in the twenties they envisioned it's almost like a satanic version of a prophecy like like I was thinking about this this morning like I I don't want to stress this too far I'm not being super literal but I was thinking like you know scripture has prophecies and I was thinking well if Satan wanted to mimic God which I think he does in many ways uh, what would be his outlet for uh, for prophetic um, signification of what's to come in the dystopian satanic system future i was thinking well it would be hollywood right i mean yeah. that's babylon it's the new babylon like kenneth anger called it <laughs> you know he talked about it as basically satan's city um and i was thinking yeah so it would be yeah you could look at movies almost like satanic prophecies in a way absolutely i mean it, it, it's like well there's no you know, people don't go to church. You know, there's the church has been fragmented and broken up into a thousand pieces. You have, you know, Protestantism rampant all around the United States. And you've got a lot of, you know, wild evangelical stuff that turns a lot of people off to even the thought of ever entering a church, right? So there's, mm -hmm. um, but pe where do people worship on the weekends? You know, they, they go, they go to the movies. They go to the new and, temple. And to sports, sports ball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the, the theaters, they're actually set up, you know, like in a very, uh, kind of like Masonic temple type way. You've got they the are. veil and point. they often have pillars on the side of the screen. And that's a great um, point. Yeah. Even, uh, you know, the Oscars and stuff with the little, mm -hmm. the little statue gods that, um, uh, that they make with their hands and worship. You know, it's, it's a very, uh, I definitely see Hollywood as kind of the religious center of the, uh, the global order right now. You know I mean? Everybody in the world watches American movies. Yeah, and, and you even have like like did you see that Dawkins quote like Dawkins yeah. saying maybe we should we should beam porn and pornography into all the theocracies to take them down? And it's like, dude, you're like uh, you know fifty years behind, you know <laughs> Miles Copeland and his book on the CIA was saying we explain could do that, that fifty yeah. years ago. <laughs> yeah, explain that. So why 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 is that not a new idea? Beaming pornography at uh, at uh, so-called theocracies. Well, in, in Miles Copeland's book, he talks about the re-engineering of Egypt from, and that's not to say that Islamic society is ideal. He's just making the point that, that when they wanted to put Egypt through phases of revolutions to bring them into the modern world so that they could ultimately get depopulation, the population down, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, he says what they had to do was break up the traditional cultures of any, of any society. He said, so one of the easiest ways to do that is to, to beam American movies in. He says, we gave Egypt... A bunch of James Bond movies, uh, and that promoted promiscuity amongst guys, and then it breaks down the family. He says, so we had to introduce many, many, many phases of this. Um, when the U.S. went into Iraq, they did this. They started beaming porn everywhere in Iraq to break down the society. So, so it's an it's an older strategy of just toxic culture. A lot of this comes out of military. If you know military strategies. You already like it's not conspiracy. It doesn't. Oh, that's crazy conspiracy talk, dude. It's just basic military strategies. Yeah. You want to, de you know, defeat your opponent. Uh, you want to weaken their morale. You want to, you want to uh, uh, fragment their society. You want to, you want to break down the traditional order. It's, it's, it's like common sense for you know how you would do it. 
So there's nothing better to break down a, a people group than to attack the bonds that unite them, namely their sexuality, uh, their their masculinity, their femininity, psychosexual drives, mm -hmm. uh, the family, um, the worldview, uh, how they view themselves, how they view the external world, uh, how they view authority, hierarchy. All those things have to be completely re-engineered, and you, they know how to do it scientifically in phases. That's the scary part. Right, so gradualism is kind of a big thing, right? You don't just make changes suddenly and abruptly because the creatures will realize it. You do it gradually. So mm -hmm. Hollywood is the perfect vehicle for that. Yeah, and, and you can then interject the more radical stuff uh, here and there. Like you can have, for example, one thing I've noticed they do, we talked about this in one of the old podcasts, is that they'll, they'll kind of float an idea maybe decades ahead of time. Right. And this is what you see with the predictive programming. So, yeah. so maybe a show comes out uh, where the pedo is is a good guy, right? And so one movie pioneers that idea way ahead of time. Everybody attacks it. It's universally seen. Oh, but then as the morals erode, twenty years later, you look. Oh, this pioneering great cinematic achievement twenty years ago that was derided by all the hateful bigots. Mm. We can look back now and see it was a great. It was a great cult film that really pioneered the rights of the pedo. And then it'll be that right. Then it'll be there's going to watch. There'll be a movie probably in the next few years of um, uh, of somebody having relations with an animal. And it's going to be yeah. a, ch a challenge to the norms of the system. Dude, you had Avatar. Well, but I mean, some, it'll be more specific, specific. Yeah, but I mean, the Avatar, you had interspecies relations there. You're right mm -hmm. through through the machines. So I guess that was yeah. He's wearing a, a computer condom, so it's okay. Well, that's why all this furry stuff and and all this kind of crap. That's just preparing people for all that. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And then also you have like, even the, in Disney movies, right? You have the hypersexualization of children through Disney films and stuff. But they even kind of sexualize animals that are anthropomorphized. Too. Beauty and the Beast. Oh yeah, forget about it. yeah. <laughs> that full on bestiality film, and that that was one of my favorite films as a kid. You know, I used to listen to the. My dad used to like the soundtrack of that movie. <laughs> Gaston. Is that the, I can show you the world. No, dude, that's a... Uh, yeah, or is that Ariel? That's Aladdin, bro. Come on. Oh, is that Aladdin? Shining, I get all shimmering, splendid. <laughs> Tell me, a princess. <laughs> Order. <laughs> yep. Well, we had, uh, I mean, that's, that's what we grew up with as millennials, dude. We had Disney movies giving us theology about the world. And it was Lion King, and it was uh, Beauty and the Beast. And uh, I guess later on they had the 3D movies, like Toy Story and stuff like that, where kids, com consumer objects become living creatures to be respected and worshipped. Uh, yeah, so. yeah and, now, and now they're all obsessed with Ilsa, and, and Ilsa is a feminist who doesn't need men she's not going to be in a relationship she's independent uh and she's a magical girl so get into witchcraft be independent you don't need a man all this kind of garbage mm. yeah so she's a strong woman an independent woman strong independent woman actually uh stefan molyneux i'm a critic of stefan molyneux but his mm. uh, his analysis of enchanted was really good I haven't seen that movie. It's, I haven't watched. There's so few newer movies I've watched. The newer Blade Runner was one of the only uh, most recent films I've watched. Have you seen? You haven't watched it yet because I'm sure you would have told me. Wow, dude. Thank you so much for recommending this to me. Have you watched Utopia? Oh, I wrote it down. I wrote the series down. Dude, Utopia. you got to watch it. It's so good. And this was a, you said it was a BBC series? No, it was a Channel 4 UK uh, series. Oh. And it lasted two seasons. And it was a really uh, interesting, uh, just it ties in a lot of the themes that you touch on a lot on your website, uh, geopolitics, there's like some, uh, you know, 70s, um, uh, there's an episode that's a flashback, and there's these MK Ultra type uh, connections going on there. Um, it's, interesting. It's, it's a very well done uh, series, it lasted two seasons, it's called Utopia. Highly suggest you look at that one. Nick, when you do, you'll have to come on here, we can talk about it, because they tie in using the food supply um, to uh, actually okay. to dis to sterilize everybody. Um, oh wow! Yeah, and binary weapons. Um, right. Uh, manipulating technology, changing, uh, changing um, CCTV camera footage instantly digitally somehow. You know, <laughs> lots of interesting. And they're they're all reading this manuscript, which is a comic book that tells everybody what's going on. And it's like there's this weird. 
um, it, it's a good. It was well done, pretty well done. It was like a, you know, the type of type of series that you would write. You know, um, I'll have to check it out. It's, I get so many recommendations that I always forget, but I will sure. check that out. Thank you. I'm sure everyone me. wants you to watch their favorite movies and do some esoteric analysis of it. Um, so we got some super. Have chats you here. seen The Lion King? <laughs> Did you do an esoteric analysis of The Lion King? Have you seen Harry Potter? Have you seen Harry Potter? Have, have you ever heard of Stanley Kubrick? <laughs> At least in Star Wars. <laughs> what is that? What is Star Wars? Um, so Nick Jones says, "Woohoo! Great, uh, uh, great way to end the week. Listening to Prime Legend Jay Dyer. Thanks, Nick Jones." Uh, Grap Three Leaf says, uh, "Speaking of fasting, could you mention Vegetable Police's twenty-one day fast? I thought it was so be- bizarre and unhealthy." Uh, Grap Three Leaf, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll talk about that in another stream because that's kind of off topic for what we're talking about now. I will say I also agree it was very bizarre, and I hope he gets well. Um, and I, who didn't see it coming? Uh, David, thanks, dude. You're always throwing super chats without even writing anything. Same with Bob Monk. Thanks a lot. John Titor, uh, John Titor, the time traveler from coast to coast back in the day says, love when you collab with Jay. Um, and then this guy right here says the movie Her with Joaquin Phoenix, which we, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, the movie Her. Any, any other, anything else strike you from Her that might be relevant to the, uh, the millennials, uh, the the world of the soyification of millennial the social engineering of the millennial i think the whole romantic relationship with technology is the obvious mm-hmm. thing there it's like your our generation has been programmed to intercourse with technology both psychologically and emotionally uh and physically soon right because we have people living in vr porn now you got like that dude uh what, Joe Rogan's friend Duncan Trussell, he's all into uh, VR and stuff like that. He's also really into the New Age stuff. He's like friends with uh, uh, with Ramdas, um, uh, the guy from uh, Timothy Leary's uh, friend. He was a psychologist mm-hmm. from Harvard. So I think those are some interesting connections. Yeah, I, I, I didn't put a whole lot into the chapter on her just because it's kind of clear what it's about. And I, I give Spike Jones credit for putting a good message because you know spoiler alert at the end of the film uh joaquin phoenix realizes that what he was looking for was right there the whole time and the chick that was after him (laughs) the chick that's like he's got some chick throwing her you know junk in his face the whole movie (laughs) he's like he's like he's obsessed with this stupid you know ethereal operating system that is is retarded the operating system basically breaks up with him (laughs) You Spike know, Jones. It's anyway. funny because Spike Jones is like a big part of my generation, especially kids who are into skateboarding and stuff. You know, he made oh, yeah. all those early skateboarding films, and uh, he was really involved with uh, with kind of the the mainstream, not even mainstream. It was counterculture at the time, but now it's more mainstream. But the whole skateboarding culture and as uh, it was another one of those fake rebellious movements um, of the '90s. But uh, you know, he he definitely mm-hmm. made a decent film there. Thought her was okay. It was a little slow. It was a little slow, but yeah. Um... Can I, I'll briefly talk about which books I or which which movies I cover in the Absolutely, book. Absolutely, man. Show the let me see the cover. What's up with the cover? Yeah, so basically I don't design my covers. The the publisher does all it's that. It's always but, funny uh, to see what the publisher thinks is gonna be uh, you know, the hot He put guy. he put I think that's Kubrick's eye. I'm pretty sure it's Kubrick kind of like I don't think he was literally trying Framing to do a the shot, eye probably. Pyramid, but he's probably looking for like the shot, you know, like how would the movie camera look, you know. Mm-hmm. Um and then we've got Tom Hanks kind of doing a Masonic thing here, yeah, and yeah. he st- he stuck Tarantino and Betty White. <laughs> Dude, Tarantino's freaking creep. I remember like ten years ago seeing uh, seeing Tarantino pictures of him like doing some weird stuff with a foot that looked very young. That guy's creepy <laughs> as shit. <laughs> uh, and then he stuck Metropolis, and then he put the Matrix in there. So then I didn't put the Matrix in. He put Agent Smith on there. But uh, I didn't put The Matrix in the first book, so I thought, well, you know, it kind of is a pretty important movie for esoteric Hollywood, so it's got to be in there. But this time around, I covered Hollywood mobs, cults, spies, and the occult. So I did Aviator, Godfather Trilogy. Uh, I talked about Hollywood terror, like uh, Lawrence of Arabia, all the way up through to True Lies. I, I do the movie Clue, Point Break, V for Vendetta, Dialectics, The Prisoner, Ninth Gate, Twin Peaks, and... Season three, Firewalk with me in season three, Back to the Future, Goonies, Ghostbusters, Poltergeist, Stranger Things, Time Bandits, uh, a section on MK Ultra and LSD with um, 
like uh, uh, Day of the Dolphin and John C. Lilly and all that stuff. Clockwork Orange, They Live, Lost Boys, American Ultra, The Cell, Neon Demon. And then I have a brief section on geoengineering with Dune, Avengers, Snowpiercer, Alien, and Signs, because those get into terraforming and that kind of stuff. Alien crap, which I try to debunk aliens, by the way. Um, section four, Hollywood transhumanism covers NGOs, uh, and what they promote. And then it does Tron, the matrix trilogy, running man, Terminator, her ex machina, Westworld, cherry 2000. And it ends with metropolis. So a lot of people are saying that they're saying they think it's a better, better written book. I, I think so. It's a more mature writing than when I did my first book, but well, you worked I'm on it for a couple of years, right? You spent a couple of years writing huh? this book. Didn't you spend a couple of years writing it or like the le- at least the last year? Yeah. 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 Nice, man. Congratulations on having it out. I'm stoked. I, I, I can't Thanks. wait to get my copy. I know it, it, It'll come soon. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you said you probably sent it out, so it's probably going to be here in a few weeks when, uh, when, my, uh, when my delivery comes. It takes a yeah, long new time. New batch is here today, so if you order it today. Most of the time within the U.S., you get it within a week. Um, I was out, so the last 20 or so orders have been back ordered, but, but I'm, I should be getting more today. You get sick of writing about movies after doing a book like this? Gonna take a break off of movie essays for a while. I did kind of take a break because I I haven't written uh, a movie analysis in several months. So mm-hmm. I did I did take a break after the book because I was I was getting sick of it. And then uh, you get to where you you start making a lot of videos and doing live streams. You get used to doing that. So yeah. So I'm in the habit now of making of making videos. I did a I did a video yesterday on that goofy Sandra Bullock movie that just came out, Bird Box. So. I uh, put that video up yesterday, and, and that's worth checking out. I mainly just made fun of it. Like, it's it's a goofy thing, and everybody is talking about this dumb movie, and people are walking around in freaking blindfolds doing the bird box challenge and all this retarded. It's, it's so what? stupid. The bird box yeah, they're challenge? Yeah, like, they're, like, trying to do – it's like, can you do the can you do the bird box challenge? What do you got to – you got to wear a blindfold and try to do, like, daily activities, and then they're, oh, let's put this on YouTube. It's so funny. It's really dumb, and the movie is not that good. So I just made fun of it for 10 minutes. <laughs> nice nice rob rom just threw a super chat says awesome job gentlemen thank you for your work yeah you know you guys jay's got a great website jaysanalysis.com right jay is that the uh, the url uh it what, is thank you yeah one yeah, of the few still... websites in the world that i uh, am subscribed to and that i you know pay for his content you know he, he does a lot of live streams puts out a lot of information a lot of not just um you know the esoteric analysis and stuff like that and pop culture analysis but he goes so deep into a lot of theological stuff that uh, that I haven't seen touched on in such a uh, in such a dynamic and helpful way by anybody else out there. Really, it's hard to find. Um, well, thanks, dude. Yeah, Appreciate so it. Check out Jay's theological stuff as well, which we got into a little bit in the beginning of the stream. Uh, but he always grounds his stuff in uh, you know a really solid worldview and reality. And I think that uh, I think that that's really lost in a lot of the people uh, you know analyzing culture these days and. I think we're seeing, you know, we, we criticized, um, uh, you see the, uh, what do you call it, uh, the alt-right stuff and neo-pagan stuff and uh, the crazy left stuff. And I think the problem with all of these is that they're not, they're not grounded in a world. They're not grounded, exactly. That will help. Right. Like, what, what, I mean, what's the solution, right? It's like all these people, are, everybody can see the problems, right? The problems are right. abundantly clear. Uh, so where do we go from there? That's what we need to start discussing as cultures, as communities, as families, as uh you know, as, as people of faith, you know, I mean, there's a lot of uh, division among all these Protestant churches and stuff. And I think one of the uh, things that I appreciate that Jay brings perspective to is the uh, the role of orthodoxy in the Christian uh, in um, you know the history of Christendom and how important this is to understanding where we're at today. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I try to talk about all that stuff. Try to make it all coherent and and relevant to one another. So it's not just you know, one area, all these areas really do tie in together. They're all related. Your health is related to your spiritual health. You know what I mean? Your physical health, your, your, the culture that you consume is related to your physical and spiritual health. So it's all related. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, all these things, there's, uh, there's no isolated, um, there's no isolated niche in any of this content you see on the internet. So I think people have to be really uh, careful about the content they do consume. Um, uh, lest it consume you. Someone says, "Eat meat." By the fans. way, uh, we're also starting to see, like, like different groups are are going in clearer, defined directions. Like the people who are going the vegan route, they're being more consistent yeah. and supporting total globalism, total 
culture of death, total degeneracy, Peter Singer type crap. Mm. They're being more consistent and it's becoming more obvious good and evil, I think. Absolutely. And and when people don't have a solid grounding in reality, they can't even believe they, they can't don't even, even tell believe it's good and evil. Yeah. It's it's what's good, what's evil. It's just you know, or do you see when we criticize the uh, the kind of the neo pagan uh, thread that we see a lot in um, in the comment sections? It's like people talk about, oh, well, that's not natural. This is natural, but how do you determine this? Right? These are the things that we need to explore as a society and as people, um, as communities. Yeah, there's not exactly an a priori clear explanation or notion of what natural is to every single person. I mean, uh, what does it mean? I mean, does it mean every single phenomena that occurs is natural if so then then anything is good death yeah. is good and in fact you could even right. argue that death death is more prevalent in nature than life you could you could possibly argue so on that basis we ought to be just total nihilists and completely embrace death i mean yeah. that's essentially the the sort of evolutionary luciferian type worldview which says that death is just as or greater than life these two principles are in nature they're dialectically connected so they're just as necessary as one another. So death is an awesome thing. But what's u unique about Christianity, in particular orthodoxy, is that it sees death as the enemy. It's, it teaches resurrection. And death is not something to be feared. It's actually transformed, St. Athanasius says, into a means by which we can achieve life. Uh, and the transhumanist movement is the inverse of that, where they're going to try to say we can overcome death through technology, I think it's a lie. It's a deception. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna transcend everything through becoming a part of Google. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you, you, we're gonna join Google and Apple and put them into our bodies and become that, and we're gonna free ourselves from from all the shackles of reality. Um, yeah, dude, you got to listen to the Ben Gertzel talk with Joe Rogan. There's some sections okay. of that that are pretty interesting. I think it's two hours or so. You can watch it on. They they talk kind of slow, so you could probably do 1.5 speed. Uh, but I think you'd like that talk because it gets into a lot of this transhumanist stuff. Um, but it, it, yeah, it we'll amazes me how ready my generation seems to be to just kind of give up what it is to be human. Uh, I mean, especially in the big cities. Humans are the problem. All right. All right. So like, you see this in – a lot of this comes out of L.A., San Francisco, uh, London, um, and I think I think a big thing that we're going to see and that we hopefully do see, and something that can kind of push up against this, we use the hashtag Eat Meat Make Families, right? Like we don't just we also use hashtag Bald Man Bad because obviously Bald Man Bad and Eat Meat Bad, you know all the standard NPC sayings that you see from the uh, from the vegans, they're, they're highly intelligent critiques. Um, but I think, you know, rural life, like living in areas where you're actually connected to um, the processes of, you know, feeding your family uh, can be very liberating for a lot of us. So, I mean, part of why I push against the vegan agenda is, is selfish because I want my children to be able to live the life that we're trying to set up for them here right now where they are connected to the land, where they, you know, my daughter goes down and does battle with a rooster every morning who she's scared shitless of because he harasses her every day. But, you know, we, the life that we like to promote is not, you know, this, um, this city-bound, um, you know, join the Borg, become a, become a YouTube star and uh, become an Instagram model. Um, I, I think that that's not the answer, guys. I think we really, we have right. to go not backwards in like a Luddite way, but we need to get connected to the source of our food, you know, go to farmer's markets, local community, um, you know, uh, bolstering that. But uh, yeah, what do you think about that, man? A resurgence of, well, I think of it's rural another example, life. It's another example of the absurdity and contradictions that are present in the postmodern transhuman worldview, the posthuman worldview, which is that on the one hand, we're told that nature should be exalted and basically worshipped, the natural world, so to speak. And on the other hand, we're told that it's 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 fallen, it's broken, and it has to be overcome and fixed. Yeah. Uh, so how is it worshipped, and at the same time, we got to transcend it because it's it's the creation of some blind idiot god, and, and it needs to be it needs to be transcended and overcome. So at every point in that worldview, it's nothing but contradiction, 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 contradiction. Right? I mean, we're supposed to to worship. Femininity, we're supposed to worship the goddess, but also those things don't exist. Femininity, uh, the idea of, of genders don't exist. So it's nothing but constant double think. And to me, that suggests that not only are they not able to accurately interpret what community should be, 
they can't accurately interpret what natural quote unquote living should be. So mm. yes, I think you are correct. The, 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 the city, the mega city, the megalopolis has for a long time been itself a means of social engineering. It's a way to get people uh, connected into a giant hive in a, a false sense of community because the mm. irony is that people that live in the megalopolises who think that they're, you know, sophisticated, they're oftentimes completely alienated. People that live <laughs> in these giant, they, they live in these giant cities and they're miserable. In fact, the sociologists like Emil Durkheim a hundred years ago, they wrote papers on how people that lived in giant cities, uh, were, I think he called it anomy or something like that. He, he could just total alienated listlessness. They had no connections to anybody. Yeah. Because the only thing they had in common was the the products they purchased. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, going back to the critique of the whole, oh, we go back to nature and nature is this and that. Like, if, if you can't define where nature ends and man-made mm -hmm. begins, then please shut up because you're just spouting a bunch of nonsense. And the arbitrary. megalopolis is just as much nature as the Amazon. Yeah, exactly. How is it not natural for human beings to make technology? It's like if it's natural for the same people that will be spouting, you know, the the, the revival of, uh, you know, primitivism, let's go back to just being nomadic, wandering cannibal tribes, these same people just wander around cities their whole life talking on iPhones anyways. But, you know, they're, they're <laughs> LARPing, right? So the same people are yeah. LARPing and they live mm -hmm. in the biggest cities in the world. But, um, yeah, the, what is natural? Why They'll say, oh, well, it's not... It's natural to, uh, you know, to sacrifice an animal and drink its adrenalized blood on, you know, every culture has done this. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's a real, it's the same mind state. It's the same mindset and the same uh, philosophy that drives the neo-pagan revival as drives the SJW. Movement. Exactly. There's no difference. It's like vegan gains philosophy is the same philosophy as a lot of the people I see in the comment section saying, yeah, like, let's... Uh, you know, let's let, let's revive uh, Odinism and, uh, and and also let's uh, let's let's be vampiric and drink human blood because it's consensual. It's cool. It's all good. Non-aggression principle. If you drink human and blood, you and you see you see this system promoting veganism and cannibalism at the same time. Exactly. Absolutely, and that's people get confused. Well, why would they promote veganism, cannibalism? Well, veganism isn't the end game. The end game is just total control of all resources and lab-grown meat. They know right. you can't live off a vegan diet, so it's the wing of the dialectic. The other end mm -hmm. is the corporate-controlled lab-grown meat structure. So I think that's what we're you know people get confused. It's like, oh, you think the world's going to be all vegan? No, it's going to be mostly plant-based, and you're going to be eating a little bit of meat that comes out of a freaking laboratory, and that Bill Gates. Uh, genetically modified to uh, to feed you because that's sustainable, um, right? So yeah, I guess that's I'm, a great point. I'm that's a great point. There. Now, when you look at the funding of all this, it all comes from the same NGOs too. You same people, it. yeah, yeah. And the same the same elites are saying that that uh, like the like, uh, those globalist books uh, in in uh, Arthur Kessler's uh, Ghost in the Machine. He says he says, look, uh, human beings practice cannibalism for centuries. It's just as natural as uh, not eating humans. Yeah, uh, and and then he can go on later to agree with all the other globalists and say we'll give you a plant-based synthetic meat diet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the the cannibalism thing. People people think I'm crazy when I say that the mainstream media pushes cannibalism, but it's all right in front of their face. Richard Dawkins said it. I know you've retweeted him. Didn't he tweet? Do you, do you know the quote from Richard Dawkins about cannibalism? Uh, Vice Magazine has done a whole bunch of things on how cannibalism isn't crazy. Maybe we should rethink it. Uh, there have been some of the globalists talk about how maybe we can figure out a way to uh, recycle human meat. That, all these crazy ideas. Mm. Um, a lot of the pop artists talk about uh, cannibalism and eating eating humans. It's not it doesn't it's not as bad as you think. It's not a taboo. Yeah, they put it um, in music videos, right? Didn't Katy Perry yeah. make a video about cannibalism? There's a Katy Perry one talking about it. Um, now you could say, oh, but she's just joking. It's just joking. But no, but actually they will look at Vice magazine. Vice magazine has put out like 20, maybe not 20, five, 10 articles about how it's cool, it's great, and all the millennials read Vice, right? So yeah. nothing wrong with eating humans. Plenty of tribes do it. What's wrong with it? It's natural. It's primitive. Tribes do it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, that, there, there's so many. It, it's funny because it, you wouldn't have expected 10 years ago for diet to become a ground for theological argumentation. <laughs> like this is – like diet is now becoming like one of these things that is bringing – you know, morality and the you know the conversation about ethics 
and theology. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. I just Googled cannibalism is good. Here's Gizmodo has an article saying cannibalism is good. (laughs) Here's SciTech magazine. Is cannibalism really that bad? Medical news. Cannibalism can be bad. Can Uh, be. Let's see. (laughs) Uh, NPR. Cannibalism is perfectly natural. (laughs) That's natural. There you go. National. Listen to this. National Geographic. Cannibalism. It is ultimately taboo, but it's very common. Hmm. Uh, Let's see. Is cannibalism wrong? Question. There's another article. This is from debate.org. So we're supposed to debate it now. Uh, Wired Magazine, debate. Is it wrong to eat people? Uh, Vox Magazine, which is total social justice warrior. Seven surprising facts about cannibalism. Oh, it's not as bad as you think. Um, oh, here we go. Live Science Magazine. Could eating the old solve our food crises? <laughs> Told you. Spoiler, yes. <laughs> what about babies? Uh, Smithsonian Magazine. New study fleshes out <laughs> the nutritional value of eating humans. Wow. Right. So, I mean, this is the thing. It's just like a lot of these people, they start. They talk about the problems. They talk about, oh, well, it's not natural or it is natural. Or some people might say, well, everything is natural. Anything that you're, you know, if you're like a biological determinist or something, well, if your DNA allows it, whatever your DNA allows, that's natural. So, uh, you know, creating technology, creating an AI god, you know, this is all natural. This is all good. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of a, uh, it, it, it's kind of silly. Right? It's like everything is natural that you can do in the physical world. It's basically saying... Like well, you can breed two different animals that can't, that can't uh, have offspring. Does that mean it's natural? Right. Well, they would say, yeah, but I mean, but, I mean you can produce sterile offspring from, from breeding different species. So just because a species can breed, it doesn't follow that it's therefore helpful or pro- progressive for that species to do so. It's like when you say something's natural, it means that it doesn't break the so-called laws of physics, right? It's like as long as yeah, right. if, if physics allows it, it must be morally permissible. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, it, I don't know, man. It's, it's going to be crazy to see what happens. It's, technology really is um, rebuilding all of civilization right now. I don't know about technology isn't rebuilding it, but through technology, all of civilization is being... Uh, reworked. And I think these types of conversations about like where we're going with this, what we really believe, what is right and wrong, what should, uh, could and can and will we do is really important. And we need to be discussing Well, this, the scary thing about it is, too, I'll, I'll add this, is that there's kind of a uh, like you kind of get what you bargain for. Like, for example, over the years, like if I've talked about the dangers of, of getting all these vaccines that they talk about getting, a lot of people will get mad. I've had so many people over the years get mad at me and say, oh, you're a crazy conspiracy theorist. And I, I, w- I would never, even if that's true, I don't want to know it because I can't live in a world that that's, that's that dark. And how are you not like miserable every day and going crazy and sad because the world's really that crazy and dark? Mm-hmm. Well, here's the thing. If you choose not to listen to these things and go your own route and you want to be blue pill and accept the system – you don't escape like you get what you pay for you get the consequences of accepting that diet you get the consequences of of the vaccines so the people who don't listen to us they really get what they pay for i mean they they it, it's not I, and i'm not saying that with pleasure but i'm saying that the system is is in a way almost set up to where if you're not strong enough or able or willing to figure this stuff out then you're going to be your own demise. You're going to be your own sterilization. I'm not saying that's good. I'm saying that's the reality of how it is. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's like we, we, you know, we build our own nest and we got to sleep in it. Um, exactly. and that's, that's kind of what's so freaky about this, uh, this cultural push towards all this madness and towards all this nonsense. And part of why you know, we decided to make a move out into a rural area uh, where we could afford to live a lifestyle that we wanted to live and where there were like-minded people around. Um, you know, it's like, I don't want to live in California for many reasons. Uh, that's, you know, I, no kinship do I have with the average uh, Californian, right? It's a totally fragmented, isolated society. Um, and the average person doesn't know their neighbors, right? It's like people are very, and there are rural communities in California, but it's very difficult to live in an area. Um, but, you know, some of these vegan advocates, you know, you got like Rich Roll. He lives in one of the be- like best areas of California in Malibu Canyon. Um, and his house didn't burn down in the fire because it was being protected by the, uh, the uh, yeah, during the, the massive wildfire. So Rich Roll's out there promoting 
uh, you know, veganism, this is the way to do it. You know, it's, it's crazy. It's like a, it's this disease of affluence. Um, you see, um, you don't see, well, any, there's no vegans in my rural community in Ecuador. <laughs> I almost view it in a weird, I mean, not literally, but kind of in a little, in a, in a, uh, tongue in cheek prophetic way that, that when I was out there, it was two weeks before the fires. And so Topanga Canyon's right next to Malibu. So I was yeah. speaking at that big hippie event and I was at, I don't, I don't know if you saw my tweet about this. I, I was at, yeah, I was at the Westworld set. So it's where they film Westworld, which is about the bots rebelling and, and overtaking the humans, by the way. Yep. And the whole set two weeks later just completely burned down. <laughs> like it's all gone. Yeah. Uh, I almost saw it like, you know, kind of a weird, almost apocalyptic, not literally apocalyptic, but in a little localized, you know, rhetorical sense. It's like if you were writing the story, <laughs> you would have yeah. known that that meant something in the greater context of the of the story. Yeah, that's I've had a lot of things like that happen to us since uh, since we left uh, like California. I'm there talking to all these hippies and, and I had a, it wasn't a huge crowd. It was I probably had 50, 60 people listening to me. But yeah. there's all these hippies walking around and I was like, I'm like. This is this is all social engineering. It's it's all a trap. Don't li- you know? Don't listen to this. You know, fake counterculture. It's a trap. And then two weeks later, the whole thing burns down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not that crazy. I'm not happy that those people were burned, but you know what I'm saying. Like it was just crazy. Absolutely not. No, no. It's terrible. Um, I mean, poor little Miley Cyrus. You know, I mean, the, you guys check out Miley Cyrus's Patreon. You can help to fund the rebuilding of her <laughs> her mansion if you need. You know, that poor. Poor Lady Gaga lost the house too. You know, I mean, these these are people who need your help. So you can find them on Patreon, guys. Did, did Lady Gaga's mansion burn down? I heard that. I don't know if it's true, but I just okay. saw like uh, what's his face, the uh, Roosh put some like. I'm I gonna didn't... go to their Patreon, dude. I'm going. I'm right now. I'm gonna donate. <laughs> I don't know if they really have Patreons. That would be funny. <laughs> But Roosh put up a Roosh put up a tweet and it was like about Miley Cyrus's house getting burned down and Roosh's tag was a cleansing fire washes through California or something like that. It was he was pretty harsh about it. I, I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, but yeah, no, it sucks. I got friends who lived in Malibu um, and who weren't very rich, who were like their parents had bought land there three generations ago and they still kind of live there and um, and their neighbors are like Will Smith and shit and they it's just a yeah, weird area right. out there. It's a very strange it is weird. place. Really, really weird place, and um, yeah. I think yeah. David David Lynch's house is there too. I hope, hope he didn't his house didn't burn down. Dude, David Lynch, that guy. I would love to sit down and have some coffee with with David Lynch. <laughs> a cup of Joe. Uh, did you write a David Lynch article back in like two thousand nine? Dude, it's a, it's a, one of the best chapters in the first one. And that was you wrote that back in like two thousand nine or ten. Because I read an no, article online. No, I wrote it. I, I wrote one. it before. Um, I wrote it probably 2015. Because I'd watched yeah. uh, his films, uh, the two of them, um, Inland Empire and Mulholland Drive. And I remember reading an article back in 2009 because I watched Mulholland Drive and there was all these references, it seemed, to Kathy O'Brien's book. Like there was these subtle references to that and I was freaked, I, so I had to go look it up, and I remember there's somebody who wrote an article saying that they claimed that David Lynch used Kathy O'Brien's crazy-ass book as source oh, wow. material for that movie. I, it was on a forum, maybe, or something. Uh, but they didn't prove it. They didn't show, yeah. they didn't document. They just claimed, so who knows. Um, no, I, I did include, yeah, I mean, Mulholland Drive, and um, I meant to put Lost Highway in, the, in part two, but it, there wasn't enough space. But uh, I did oh, put... So weird. A long Twin Peaks analysis and Mohan Drive in the first book. Um, but what was neat about that was that I wrote my analysis of Twin Peaks and it, it did really well, put it on the blog a long time ago, 20, 2015. And then, like, right after that, Mark Frost wrote his book preparing for the new season of Twin Peaks. And he's the, the co creator of Twin Peaks with Lynch. But the weird part was that everything that was in his book confirmed my analysis because people have been debating what Twin Peaks is about for mm-hmm. 20 years. Yeah. And so everything that was in, I'm not saying he read it, but, but it was just funny to me that like, man, my analysis was, was spot on. I, I nailed all of it. And what, then, what uh, did you, what, what did you think your Twin Peaks was about? Just, I mean, you don't have to give away your whole article or your whole, uh, your whole chapter. There. Well, it's a lot of different things, but it's just simply put, it's a, it's a satire of America. It's a satire of, of soap opera culture, which was, you know, a lot bigger in the late early nineties than it is now. But the music was hilarious. America, the music was so funny. America's kind of right. America's kind of a soap opera. It's it's a neo noir. It's it's 
uh, dark satire. It's all those things at once, but it's also a commentary on the esoteric, that there's a darker side to America, to, to ritual cults, to human sacrifice, all the stuff that people have no idea about that I think does exist. And I think that, that, you know, it's pretty crazy that that was on mainline TV back in the nineties. Cause you know, 1991, 92 mainline TV was, was pretty, I mean, it was dumb, but it was pretty tame. And this is pretty like, whoa, out there type stuff. Well, yeah. And uh, even when he tied it up in the end, right. It was it, the, the fours or what was it? Frank was the guy. What was the, was it Frank? Who was the, the spirit that, was, Frank is in Blue Velvet, but uh, Bob oh. Bob is basically yeah he's a demon and he's he oh. possesses yeah he possesses the serial killer. Um, well, at, before he possessed Wyndham Earl, the serial killer. Before that, he possessed Laura's dad, who was molesting her. Yeah. So you know and, she's the and prom prostituting queen. She's her the, out, right? Exactly, and pimping her out. So it was about child sex slavery and all that stuff too. Which I mean, where where do you see that ever getting uh, getting discussed except for? Uh, in uh, banned YouTube channels. Oh, and yeah, and suddenly, yeah, exactly. It's all it's all in the news, and uh, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, the, you mentioned Blue Velvet. That movie is so disturbing. I couldn't. I, I watched that one time. I, I couldn't watch it again. It so, <laughs> uh, just just because you, I knew that. What's his face? Uh, what's the actor? Um, Kyle McLaughlin. Caps Blue Ribbon. What what's his name? Uh, oh, Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper. That guy is a madman. He is a man. In fact, he comes up in um, in uh, Dave McGowan's Laurel Kenyon book as a big part of the Laurel Kenyon scene, who was very into the occult and um, was quite literally. I mean, I don't know Dennis Hopper, but I'm saying the way Dave speaks of him in the book is that he actually was like a madman, like Frank, <laughs> the character in Blue Velvet. Well, it's like you, anybody who's ever done theater or something like that understands that there's. Uh, it could be a dangerous practice. <laughs> you could tell that he was pretty deep into that character uh, to, a, to yeah. an extent that became very disturbing. Um, but yeah, yeah, you yeah, know what I really like? The really weird sex stuff, you know, that, that, that seems to come out, yeah. And the, just, just so abusive to everybody around right. him. Um, Psychopathic, yeah. Very, very, yeah, very, very, uh, and, and enjoying the abuse, right? Like really enjoying the abuse. What I one of my favorite I I did like Mulholland Drive I think that was probably my favorite. What's your favorite Lynch film? I like uh, Dune. I like Lost Highway. I like uh, Firewalk with Me, uh, the Twin Peaks movie. Um, I like. I mean, I like Mulholland Drive. Okay. Uh, at, the older I get, the less the more I like Lost Highway. I think it's a better film than than Mulholland Drive nowadays. Lost Highway. I would have. I would have at one time had that reverse, but now now I think it's the other way around. Um, yeah. yeah, those are Inland Empire. It's I like it okay, but it's so long and dark and so disorienting too. It's so difficult and and yeah, disorienting to watch that it's hard to really like it. You can appreciate aspects of it, but it's a little too uh, disjointed. But um, but yeah, I think uh, I think he's pretty. He's one of the few directors that usually does well i mean i even because i grew up as a sci-fi nerd i mean even even his hated movie dune I, i'm a big fan of it just because i mm. I like the dune novel the story's great it has a lot of predictive programming in it um and i i it was a a noble attempt at making the most difficult sci-fi story ever that nobody can seem to pull off <laughs> yeah. i think they're going to try to do it though some there's a new version somebody's trying to to make dune wow is it Dan Denis Villeneuve or whatever the guy who made Blade Runner? Maybe that was who it was going to be, and and yeah, a lot of people keep trying, but they they can't pull it off. There were there was going to be the uh, Jodorowsky was going to do it, and uh, <laughs> the, uh, Salvador Dali was going to play Baron Baron uh, uh, Harkonnen, and he de he demanded that Jodorowsky pay him a million dollars a minute <laughs> for every minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so. Uh, I don't know if this is true, but the story is Jodorowsky said, uh, okay, yeah, dude, I'll do that. And then, so he filmed him for like five or six minutes. And, and since the movie never aired, he never paid him anything. <laughs> <laughs> but Dolly was, Dolly, Salvador Dolly was a complete lunatic. And I mean, that guy I was, know. you could see him at, the, at these, like, um, at these galas with, uh, with a lot of these European elite. Like, um, have you seen some yeah. of those photos? He's at the, I think he went to some of the Rothschild, uh, stuff and mm -hmm. he would hang out with, um, with Man Ray and John 
Houston, who wow. are supposed to be part of the Black, the Black Dahlia Circle. Yeah, yeah, the John Houston. That's interesting. And his daughter is Angelica Houston, right? Angelica, right, who was... It was at her house, supposedly, that Roman Polanski yep. uh, had the incident with the 13-year-old girl. I think that's uh, what Yeah. And now, and now Roman Polanski is, uh, is lauded in Hollywood as this hero. Yeah, and I think he's still in France. He can't come to America or something. So, yeah, they've been trying to say for a long time, like, Let, lift the ban on R- Roman Polanski or whatever. <laughs> Well, yeah, Which Lost is, Highway. I might have to. I might have to revisit I Lost did Highway. Hear somebody have a good point on that one time. They said. They said. Well, you can say uh, Roman Polanski uh, is a bad guy. It's like, but but America uh, just celebrated the deaths of George W. Bush, and now the the media has rehabilitated Bush Jr. Uh, and arguably, they are more evil than Roman Polanski. I mean, I mean, Roman Polanski hasn't uh, been responsible for the death of like a million Iraqis. So no, I guess Bush Jr. is so cute. Did you see him and Michelle Obama have such a sweet yeah. relationship? Did you see all yeah, <laughs> Have a piece of candy. Have a piece of candy, Michelle. That's <laughs> so <laughs> funny. Yeah, yeah. The, butterscotch or peppermint. The media just like destroys these people. It acts like they hate them for, for and then, decades. Oh, remember, I remember how they used to destroy McCain. Yeah, yeah, uh, McCain, the warmonger. Like McCain was the villain, like in two thousand nine, ten, and then yeah, now McCain is like a, an American saint, like Ronald Reagan. He's amazing. The, McCain was such a great American. <laughs> it's like American yeah, McCain here. is a great American. I I fought in the War of eighteen twelve. I've been here fighting for America when I was calling out and lying on all my POW buddies to to escape the prisoners. So to, I didn't want to be a prisoner of war, so I lied my way out. But I'm a hero. That's a pretty good McCain voice. That was pretty damn good. That was polished. Bomb, oh. bomb, bomb. I, um, I was talking about this scene from Mulholland Drive with my wife the other day, and it was it was kind of very reflective of American culture and just kind of the falseness of how people live their lives these days. And the, you know, the, I like how that movie starts out, and it's so weird and fake, and it's like this girl and her grandparents are sending her off to, yeah, the sock hop. Dance. Yeah, and 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 the she's like at the airport, and her grandparents, okay, honey, you go go off to Hollywood, and and she's like, okay, grandma, I'm gonna be a star. And yeah. it's just so fake, and you're like, what is going on with this film? What is this is really strange, and and it's like that. The vibe is so fake, um, the whole time up until she's auditioning, and she goes into this audition, and this creepy old like producer guy shows up, and it just gets. So real and so hypersexual and so um, just very predatory, erotic, um, and it 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 was just that was a fascinating scene to me. And it's funny now with all the you know everyone talking about Harvey Weinstein and stuff like that, yep. and casting couch, exactly. And it's like exactly. the, o- the only moment that the woman seemed like a human being is suddenly she's hypersexualized as a victim being dominated by a much older man, uh, who apparently allegedly you know it seems in the movie like he's this is the first time she met him. Um, right. And that that scene was so dark and so well done and the way that it switched up everything mentally, I thought that that was a yeah. a good piece of filmmaking and it it only has that effect once when you first watch it. So but um Well yeah. that aspect is similar to what we see uh in what all three of the Hollywood trilogy. So whether it's Lost Highway or Mahan Drive or Inland Empire, the the three female leads are all presented as either actresses aspiring to be actresses involved in, in Hollywood to some degree and movies in some degree. And, and in, in every case there's, there's a presentation of them as basically uh, either porn stars or crack whores. I mean, the, <laughs> both. the, the, the Laura Dern character is presented in one version and whether it's an alter in her mind or an alter reality, I'm not sure. I think it's supposed to be an alter version of her, but she's just hanging out of this whorehouse with a bunch of nasty, skanky whores. Um, we see the the Julia Ormond character uh, is basically wandering the streets, and if I recall, isn't doesn't the end of Inland Empire have Laura Dern as basically a crack whore on the street? I think that's how it um, ends, right? That's like the yeah, last and, scene; and, and, she's and, just burnt out and done. Exactly. the The Naomi Watts character, it turns out, was an aspiring actress who ended up a crack whore, yep. hiring a hitman to kill her her the lead because she didn't get the role. Yep. Um, and then the uh, Rose- uh, the Patricia Arquette character is uh, aspiring actress perhaps 
who basically was in porn. And then mm. the Fred Madison character basically finds out, oh, baby, what were you doing all those years? Oh, I was sorry. I, I forgot to tell you, by the way, boyfriend, fiance, whatever. I was in porn for a long time. Sorry, I forgot to tell you that. That was the that was my old porn director at the party. <laughs> So, so all three of those, what my, I just, me and my friends call the Hollywood trilogy, they yeah. all have that set, that same theme that it's basically just a machine that swallows up people and spits them out. Right. And just destroys all their moral compass, destroys their humanity essentially. And, and, and on a, on a social wider scale, that's what it does to everybody else too. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's why I was thinking about that scene too, is, you know, just how, you know, the only time people, pe people feel more. I don't know, just, just how false people are in their life. It's, just, it's so sad these days with all the social media, with all the posturing, with all the, you know, the selfies. Um, it, it, it really is sad to see a lot of people in my generation just living this kind of hard Dude, have you, seen, have you seen Under the Silver Lake yet? No, I'm going to have to watch that one. Silver you got to watch this. Uh, it's it's very Lynchian type of movie, and, and it's, it's basically a millennial who is looking at Hollywood and pop culture. He's a big fan. I think he's just hanging out. I don't think he wants to do movies he, i think he wants to do he's a writer he wants to write or write a screenplay or write a comic book or something like that i can't remember what his goal is but he's just kind of hanging out partying and 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 having fun and living a hedonistic life so he starts noticing that there's patterns in movies and there's patterns in pop culture and he starts wondering if it's on purpose so it leads him down this long rabbit hole he meets all these chicks who are you know, aspiring actresses and they're basically just whores. They're basically mm. like <laughs> they're brought into prostitution and they're sleeping their way into these roles. So he starts wondering like, is that how they're getting ahead? Is that what's going on? And he, he goes down this long ass rabbit hole and I won't spoil it, but he, he, he finds the people that control culture uh, and confronts them. And it's, I'm going to have to watch it again because I'm not exactly sure what I think the ending is yet. Cause okay. I've only seen it once. Yeah. But uh, it's it's actually got some funny funny stuff to it. A little raunchy in some parts, so yeah. I'm not recommending it. Don't watch it with with kids. But yeah. um, if you're a fan of Lynch and you like critiques of Hollywood and and the idea of pop culture conspiracies, uh, Under the Silver Lake is worth watching. Have you, have you watched? Uh, I think I, I tweeted it to you before a scene from it. But have you, have you watched Spring Breakers yet? I still haven't yet. Um, but, it's a, uh, that's an interesting movie. All right, so I mean, first I of mean, all, you I got know, uh, James Franco who like did Kenneth Anger right. films and stuff, and he's really you know this weird. Well, Harmony, Harmony Corinne is from Nashville, and I've never met Harmony Corinne, but I, there's we have some mutual people in our friend circles. But uh, he's made some interesting films. I thought Kids was interesting, but he's also made some pretty pretty out there stuff like he Trash made, Humpers. Yeah, and Gummo, Gummo was like this really. He did do that? Movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, I, uh, I haven't seen Trash Humpers, but Kids was really influential when I was growing up. I thought it, you know, exactly. obviously it was a very, it was a harsh movie, but it was, uh, it was reflective of that reality for sure. Um, yeah, Spring Breakers is cool, man. Uh, it, it's got uh, the Disney princesses in it, just like really? horrified. Yeah, it's, uh, what's it, Selena Gomez. Um, uh, Justin okay. Bieber's is ex-girlfriend. She plays a, a character called Faith. And the movie starts out um, with them in the dorm rooms, and, and it just shows college life for these kids um, and how degenerate right. it is. And it's very empty, and they all speak in, like, Facebook status posts, basically. Weird speak, yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and, and it's narrated through their voices at times as if they're talking to their mother or grandma. And it's very jarring the way that the imagery relates to what they're saying. So it's like, oh, I'm meeting all these amazing people here at spring break. And it just shows, like, these gross guys, the ATL twins, who were, like, these pop culture f figures a few years ago. And there's, like, snakes around in this room and uh, very <laughs> serpent in it, and they're snorting coke. And it's just disgusting. And they're like, oh, I'm just, that's so amazing. I'm learning so much. Was it based on Riff Raff? I remember thinking is that, that, that there's some is that guy Riff Raff. Dude, James Franco's Riff Raff is based on James Franco's character because James Franco is so he's so crazy in this movie. There's this scene where he's like jumping around on a bed and he's like, "Look at all my shit." But but, Riff, but Riff Raff Riff Raff had that same exact same look aesthetic and everything yes. before the movie totally yeah it looks just like he looks freaky man there's this reveal shot where you know he's in the courtroom the girls get arrested for like being at a party and there's coke or something and uh yeah and and this the this long shot on a steady cam of him like smiling and his grills popping out it just looks disgusting <laughs> dude and he like just the way every line he delivers just sounds so slimy and just so gross. Like I think I'm in love with y'all. Like he's got this southern accent. He's like, 
He's all greasy, like rapid. It's hard not to like Riff Raff, though. I mean, I think Riff Raff's funny. Riff Raff's uh, hilarious. It's... Remember when he got on steroids and got like 200 pounds, was all jacked yeah. and eating all the time? That was so funny. He's like, I don't do crack. I just work out now. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that film's good, man. I think you'd like Spring. I mean, it's a horror. I will have film. to watch Spring Break. It's, it's I'm surprised. Horrific... I, I think I just forgot about it. Yeah, it's really it's a horrifying. It's a horror movie, and it's all about MTV culture. Oh. And they've got a Britney oh, wow. Spears song in it at one point. Um, um, it's I thought it was well done, and the ending is really interesting. I'd be interested to see in what how you interpret. Yeah, uh... remember the uh, Richard Kelly film? His last one. That um... one with The Rock. Yeah, remember there was a, Pimps there was never an die. <laughs> there was an interesting commentary on uh, uh, the pop. There was like a Britney type pop girl. Remember that? I need to go back and rewatch that. I just that remember the movie. line "Pimps never die" and like all these weird resurrection scenes and like. There was that would be a good uh, analysis to do. Maybe I think, dude. Well, I really uh, think you'd like. Uh, yeah. What's that? Maybe it's. I, I'm going blank. What is it? Oh man, I forget. I'm sure if you just. Uh, look, um, oh, I'll look it up right now. Uh, Donnie Darko. That was one of my favorite films growing up, though. Yeah, Donnie Darko's good. What is that film called? The Rock. It, it, there was several versions of it. There was the uh, director's cut that was like an hour longer. Southland Tales. Southland Tales, that's it. Yeah. I, I thought Southland Tales was pretty good. A lot of people didn't like it. I, I thought it was uh, thought it was pretty good. And then Richard Kelly uh, like totally went like Hillary Cuck. So anytime I see those directors, like, you know, it's like you make these really interesting critiques on culture and society. And, oh, now you're like total Democrat cult member. It seems like that happens with so many people from these different subcultures. And it's I mean, I think it all comes down to just like, what are they grounding their worldview? And like you. Yeah, everybody sees the problems. We can all see this. There's divine revelation showing us always what we're doing wrong, what's going on. But, uh, you know, if you can't. If you can't ground your reality in the truth, then you're going to be deceived really quickly. And everybody is worried about getting a job and work. And, you know, mm -hmm. entertainment is dominated by, you know, the left. So, yeah, right. If your bottom line's affected, it's hard to, uh, to admit that, you know, you might not be doing the right thing. <laughs> Donnie Darko was a funny do you, have you, So, yeah, I'm going to check out uh, Utopia and I'll check out Spring Breakers. Sweet. And you check out. Uh, under the Silver Lake. Tell me what you think. Cool. Yeah, we'll maybe we'll do a podcast. Maybe we'll do it on your channel sometime. We we'll talk about some of these movies. When you when Let's you do, do how about the, when you watch these the next, things, the let me know. Dream, the next dream, you come on mine and and let's have these movies watched and we'll we'll, we'll go through them. Okay. Cool. Which one do you want to do first? Utopia is like thirteen let's episodes. Do, let's do Under the Silver Lake and because since Utopia is a series, I'll do you you watch Under the Silver Lake and I'll watch Spring Breakers. Cool. Sounds good. All right. All right, so everybody in the audience, thanks for hanging out. Check out jaysanalysis.com. Jay's got a YouTube channel. Both are linked down below. Check out his new book. I bought myself a signed copy. You don't get it from Amazon. Get it from Jay. He will sign it. The shop. At the, you go to the website, there's a shop. You can purchase it there. If you pay and him $100 copy. extra, Jay will sign my name on the book. Um, <laughs> uh, I signed Riff Raff on it, dog. He'll sign Riff Raff. He'll sign, he'll sign it as David Lynch if you want. Um, I'll autograph it as David Lynch. Dude, would, yeah, we gotta get David Lynch on the podcast. <laughs> That'll ever happen. Do you um, remember when he came on? I remember uh, I was listening to Alex Jones back when he came on Alex Jones and talked about nine eleven. When was that? Two thousand three. Probably. Does Alex Jones talk about nine eleven ever anymore? I think he did yesterday because there's going to be a document dump by a hacking group of nine eleven. The Q. Wow. No, no. This is supposed to be a – this is uh, a – well, if you listen – I'll put it this way. If, I, don't, I check in on Alex Jones every now and then. He's entertaining. And I happened to listen to a little bit of it yesterday. So the first hour of yesterday's show, he talks about uh, this whole 9-11 document dump and who's behind it. It's been so interesting seeing his trajectory over the years, right? Like when you fir when I first heard him, it was like, well, what what's up with this guy? Is this guy like – is this guy a shill or is this guy for real? Um, I feel like everybody kind of still, everybody tunes in Alex every once in a while to try and see what the heck he's really about. He's a, the Alex Jones enigma. Um, <laughs> people in the chat are saying he's a shill. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's funny. Everybody can seem like a shill to everybody else. 
if they disagree with one thing that you believe, right? So it's like everyone's a shill. Bill Hicks, they're saying. <laughs> yeah. People are saying I'm actually a trans bald person. That's true. I don't, I'm not actually bald. I shave my head. See, there's fuzz, guys. I'm trans bald. Trans vegan. What if you're a trans trans? Does that mean you're normal? Uh, dude, I'm, you just blew my mind. I don't even know. Trans trans. That's, that's the sound of one hand clapping. The sound of one hand clapping. Sound of one hand fapping more like, oh, <laughs> snap. <laughs> Oh, hey, dude, I'm gonna have to yeah, I go do something. But yeah, me too. Thank man. you for having me on. Thanks always a lot, dude. Stranger. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's, it's always great talking to you, Jay. Have a great day, everybody. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, hashtag Eat Meat, Make Families. Uh, let, let's take back our health, take back our families, and take back our cultures, guys. We got to discuss where we're bringing these cultures, uh, where we're going to drive this cultural train. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that everybody uh, in the audience and uh, people like Jay are out there asking the real questions and getting deep on. Um, what's real and what's going on. So check out jaysanalysis.com, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace, reflections.